Introduction of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another week of debate. All of those who are joined in uh, online, uh, and those, uh, that's brave soul who has joined us in the public gallery, uh, who is a lifelong friend of mine from the Kings County capital of Georgetown, uh, my friend Mark Gotell, uh, former mayor, councillor, fire chief. He'd have a long resume of volunteer activities down in our hometown, but uh, uh, we've been through a lot of things together, Mark and I, over the years. Not many of them fit for discussion in this chamber, uh, Madam Speaker, but I want to welcome Mark. He is a keen viewer of uh, politics, uh, municipally, provincially, and federally, so I hope you enjoy the proceedings today, and welcome. I uh, wanted to begin by saying what a, uh, a hub of activity uh, Prince Edward Island has been the last couple of days, in particularly the western part of the province, uh, where many, many islanders and for people from around the world uh, made the trek uh, to West Prince to, to view the eclipse yesterday, and it was uh, uh, tremendous activity that many or most islanders participated in. Uh, of course, there was a new curling club opened up there on the weekend as well, so West Prince is booming. Tory times are good times for the West. That seems to be what they're saying up there. So, uh, um, uh, But uh, also yesterday, uh, uh, the first cruise ship of the season landed in Charlottetown as well, and it was great to see uh, 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 this kickoff. Uh, what a great day it was, and uh, the city and the province uh, say was humming. It gives us hope that we're... Some good days are ahead for all of us here, so I hope everyone enjoyed the eclipse and watched it safely and, and uh, got to experience a once-in-a-lifetime once experience. It was great. Um, I wanted to just uh, follow up since I've been kind of giving the hockey summaries each day. We had a bit of a hockey wrap-up on the weekend. Uh, the Kensington Wild, of course, were competing in the Atlantic Championships and won uh, the Atlantic title. Uh, defeating Halifax 10 to nothing in the final to show how dominant the Atlantic team was this year, uh, the, the Kensington team was. They'll move on now to the TELUS National Championships uh, for under-18 AAA, uh, and they'll take place in Member 2 uh, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, uh, Member 2 First Nation uh, in a couple of weeks' time, so that'll be exciting uh, for the Wild. So congratulations to all the players, coaches, and managers in that. Uh, the Kings County under-18 uh, AAA uh, stackers, I mean the Kings, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, won the Island Championship, a uh, really, really strong team. Uh, assistant coach or co-coach is the uh, Minister of Tourism, Sport and Culture for PEI, and they had a great team, so I wanted to congratulate all of those wonderful young players, and of course the son of the member from uh, Moraldona, uh, obviously there as well, uh, a key member of that team, so all the best. Our Eastern Stars uh, uh, girls team lost, a heartbreaker in the final of the Atlantics in Newfoundland, and the Eastern Dukes, even more heartbreaking, lost the final in overtime for the Atlantic Championship, so uh, it was difficult, uh, but uh, well done by all of those teams, and of course our Western Capitals are battling a 2-2 series with uh, the Amherst Ramblers, the pesky Amherst Ramblers. So game <laughs> five is tomorrow night uh, in Summerside. And uh, if I can make my schedule work, I'm going to attend that game and root on the caps. I think it'll be a full house, so get there early. And just finally, I did want to take a moment to offer uh, my congratulations and thanks. And my, of course, um, uh, my son Jacob uh, is, a, is a very uh, outgoing entertainer. And he and his partner, Melissa McKenzie, uh, have written and co-star in a production called the 1984 Songbook at the Harmony House. And the first two shows were held this weekend. It's a wonderful walk through the year of 1984. It was a great year for pop music, but a lot of really amazing things happened in the world as well. And the way they go about sharing those stories was really, uh, it was a fun experience. Everyone really enjoyed themselves. Uh, of course, it also stars Josh Rayom, uh, Sam Langell, and Trevor Grant. It's a tremendous production. There's two more shows this weekend that are sold out, but I think Harmony House might have to find a way to hold them over. I think it's very, very popular. And not to give away anything, but there is a part where uh, they talk about the history of Myron's in Charlottetown and all of the acts that take place there, which is really, really good. If you grew up in that generation like some of us did, it, it's, it's a must-see. But just want to say to, to Jake and Melissa, keep up the great work. They work really hard. I'm very proud of them, and I love them very much. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Leader of the Opposition. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all those who are watching online and those who are joining us in the gallery today uh, to watch or to view today's proceedings. Welcome. Um, I said last week I wasn't going to talk about the solar eclipse anymore, but I do have to talk about it today, definitely. Anybody that was on Facebook yesterday saw that it was ex it exploded with uh, photos and posts of hundreds of people from the east uh, driving up west to take pictures and videos of the eclipse and then hundreds of people from up west taking pictures of all the traffic. So it was, uh, it was an exciting time up home. Um, you know, there's a lot of excitement leading up to it and when was the partial part of it, I was thinking, okay, maybe I was wrong about all this, right? And I'd look up every now and then and I'd put my glasses on and I'd look up and it was almost, it reminded me of like the view masters we used to have. It was just that little, you know, slide we had. But anyway, but whenever the moment of totality began, it was unbelievable. It was like, so all that, all last week led up to that three minutes and ten seconds of just pure, um, I, I can't even describe the word, but anyway, it was nice to be next to Bicentennial Park. There was hundreds of kids there and their families and just the, the noises, the, the oohs and the ahs that they were making uh, and the memories that those children will have later on uh, that were made yesterday. So I want to thank anyone who um, did anything uh, on Prince Edward Island to organize an event or a viewing party. Uh, thank you very much for not only providing something for the locals, but the tourists, the many tourists. And in conversations yesterday, uh, it was just, you'd see these uh, setups with these telescopes and these cameras, uh, they were unbelievable. I think a half ton truck would have to bring them in. But people came from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, just for this one event, and they chose Prince Edward Island for it. So, uh, you know, it was nice for them to come here. The weather cooperated. Um, it couldn't have been a, a better day overall for that. At North Cape, uh, the RCP had to actually uh, get on the road and turn people away. And it was like, you know, the road was closed, you have to turn around, you have to go find somewhere else. So there were a few uh, four by fours that had to go out and rescue people from fields, uh, tourists that went in and thought the fields might be a place to park their vehicle, but yet they, they couldn't get very far in. But everybody participated, uh, not participated, but helped them out. So at the end of the day, it turned out pretty good. One fellow from Saskatchewan had his vehicle covered with mud and he was all excited. He said he couldn't, but he was taking pictures of the vehicle to go back home to show them. So anyway, it was, it was good to have up home, but on a, a softer note, today in 1917, April the 9th, was the first day of three days of uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge. And uh, so we know that Canada was victorious in seizing Vimy Ridge, which is located in uh, northern France. And it was a defining, a defining moment in Canada uh, when the country emerged from under the shadow of, of Britain, and it felt capable greatness at that time, Madam Speaker. So it really meant a lot uh, to the country. However, this victory came with uh, a, a terrible cost with more than 10,000 uh, fatalities or injuries in it. And uh, we, we never forget the contribution that they made uh, to our country. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to, to everybody and welcome to everyone joining us in the gallery. Lovely to see some young people in here with us today. Thank you for being here and everyone joining us from Charlottetown, Victoria Park and all across the island. Um, I just came from my big cousin Jason's celebration of life and the, uh, the pastor during his sermon talked about the importance of what I took from that, I should say, it was, it was a beautiful sermon, but what I took from, from what he said I think is something that when I remember Jason I will choose to think about this, but he said um, to sit across from people you don't understand and listen and see what comes from that, and the friendships that actually may come from that. And I notice that's something that I've been dealing with a lot in my life lately, is there's been a lot of people that I, that I wouldn't necessarily share a lot in common with on first glance, but when you start to talk and dig down, you can always find um, some common ground. And in a time when things are so polarizing, I think that that's more important than ever for all of us to remember. So I thought I would share that with you just briefly today. Um, the eclipse. Oh my gosh, it was so, I don't, even, I don't have a word either, but it was so incredible and it was so funny because my plan was to go to Tignish and I was doing breakfast program yesterday morning and they said, do you know how much traffic there's going to be if you go up there? And I thought, oh, that's true. But I had glasses for my parents, so I had to get 
to Summerside somehow. So I got picked Gracie up from school. I think we joined the first group of cars leaving Charlottetown and um, made it to Summerside. And I'm so glad I did because my, my uncle isn't able to get out of the house much. So I ran some glasses over to him so he could enjoy it. And, and everyone, none of us, I thought I'd just sit in Charlottetown. And I was like, well, it doesn't matter if I don't see the full thing. But now that I've seen the full thing, holy cow, it, it did matter. It was so incredible. And, and it was just, I mean, it was so humbling and, and so cool. I could, that's, I, I'm like uh, the leader of the official opposition. I don't really have a word to describe it. It was just awesome. And uh, PEI Band Days are happening today in Summerside at the Scott McCauley Performing <laughs> Arts Centre from 9 to 2.30 today. And then for two days on Wednesday and Thursday, it will be in Charlottetown at the new UPEI Theatre. And the admission is free and what a great opportunity to check out the incredible talent that we have in, in school bands. You know, you may get to say you saw them there first when they make it to the big time. Um, the PEI Watershed Alliance is having its 2024 AGM on Thursday, April 11th from 5 to 7 at the Farm Centre, which is at 420 University. University Avenue here in Charlottetown. And the guest speakers for the evening will be Carla Hicks and Brian Hulbert. And they're both from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And of course, Adam McLean also from PEI's Department of Agriculture. And last but not least, Madam Speaker, as, as winter sports season winds down and spring, summer season, hockey, uh, oh my gosh, <coughs> hockey is just on the brain. As, as spring and summer sports um, ramp up, I just really would like to once again thank everyone involved to make it happen. The coaches, the managers, the parents for getting the kids there and, and the kids for having good attitudes and giving it their all. Thank you, Madam Speaker. General Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it is a pleasure to rise here, certainly to welcome all the ones who are joining us here in the gallery this afternoon, and all those that are joining in uh, online, certainly those that may be joining in from District 26. And as uh, the Premier had uh, alluded to, there was a great official grand opening of the West Prince Curling Club up in District 26 this last Saturday afternoon. Uh, pleased to have the, the member from O'Leary Inverness uh, join us at that uh, event. Uh, but uh, Madam Speaker, I really want to give a shout out to the volunteers uh, that brought this dream to a reality. And in particular, Claire Sweet, Audrey Callahan, Bob Matheson and Victor Hogan and state my appreciation to all of them and all of the other volunteers that worked so hard to bring this uh, to a reality. And finally, Madam Speaker, I uh, just want to give a fair bit of advance notice of a couple of events that are coming up at West Isle Theatre on April 26th and 28th. And it is a variety show with the proceeds from uh, these shows are going to fundraising for the new ultrasound equipment that is going to be put in place at Western Hospital. Uh, the door is open at 6.30 for both uh, dates with the show starting at 7 o'clock. So I wanted to give lots of advance notice so that everybody here in this legislature and right across the province can plug that into your calendars, make sure you get up to West Prince, uh, probably won't be quite as much of a caravan headed west as there was yesterday, but it'd be great to see ones from right across the island at that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, good afternoon to everyone here in, in our gallery and to those watching from District 11, especially faithful watcher Eileen Stewart. Um, it was a nail-biter in Moncton on Sunday as the Dukes mm -hmm. U16 hockey team made it through to the championship game of the Maritime Tournament. Unfortunately, they fell short in a heartbreaking loss 4-3 overtime to uh, Nova Scotia. But I'd like to say I proudly watched a number of players who developed from little power skaters to representing PEI in this Maritime Championship. And I'd like to shout out a congratulations to all the team, the coaching staff, parents, and fans for a great season. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to welcome every, everybody in the legislature today, especially everybody in the gallery. It's great to see so many young faces here. I hope that you enjoy the debate that's going to happen today. Uh, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's watching online, especially from the greatest district, District 21. My faithful watchers, Joan and Carrie and Elizabeth and Kathy. Uh, I'd just like to touch on a couple things that the Premier had already addressed is uh, Tomorrow evening will be game five in the best of seven series of the, the Junior A series that's going on with the Western Capitals and the Amherst Ramblers. The Capitals have been perfect at home in this 
series of playoffs and uh, it should be great to see everybody out there to support them Wednesday evening and just wanted to leave it at that Madam Speaker. Go Caps go. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome everybody in, in the gallery and, and everybody at home who, who's watching. And um, Madam Speaker, yesterday I had the opportunity to visit a number of senior clubs in the Summerside area, and uh, a lot of those folks told me that they watched the legislature faithfully, so I would like to say hi to them today. Um, Madam Speaker, on Friday night, I had the opportunity to attend the induction ceremony for the PEI Sports Hall of Fame at Credit Union Place in Summerside. It was a wonderful evening, and I would like to recognize the inductees. Argyle Shores' Katie Baker, who played for Canada's national field hockey team and served as captain. Charlottetown's Ray Moore, who spearheaded the return of rugby in Prince Edward Island. Ricky Burns of Charlottetown, a, lo um, a long-time coach and volunteer in five-pin bowling in Special Olympics, and the 1969-70 Charlottetown Islanders hockey team who captivated fans in their bid to capture Memorial Cup. There were a number of them there, maybe 20 members. I wish I had all of their names, but I'd like to congratulate all of them. Um, I would also like to thank the PEI Sports Hall of Fame board members and their chair, Paul H. Skierman, for all of the work that they do to recognize our PEI athletes. And last but not least, uh, Madam Speaker, today my grandson, Jace Lee, turns 10 years old. And I would like to wish him a happy birthday from Nana. And I will be there for supper. So have a great day, Jace Lee. And thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome everyone in the gallery and everyone uh, watching online in District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, a famous person in District 10 is uh, watching right now, Heather Dorn. Um, I had a conversation this morning with Heather. Um, a lot of us in here would remember Heather uh, as the executive director at the Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, and with the Dream Cottage coming up. Um, the draw for that, or actually the tickets are going to be sold on the 26th, but now she's working at the uh, Bookmark, the uh, bookstore here in Charlottetown, and she wanted me to remind all Islanders that coming up on the 27th of uh, this month is the Independent Bookstore Day. So get out and support your local bookstores. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all of my colleagues. Uh, hello to everyone tuning in from across the island and those tuning in from the greatest district, District 9, Charlottetown Hillsborough Park. And hello to all those joining us here in the gallery. It's wonderful to see such uh, youth, uh, full faces. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, certainly yesterday was an exciting day. I know my six-year-old, uh, when he hopped out of bed, uh, he, he immediately jumped out of bed and he said, it's happening, Mom. And he ran to the window and he grabbed his glasses. And I said, no, you'll have to wait, Henry. It's not happening for a couple hours. But it was pretty sweet. He was really excited. So I think that was the um, feeling across the island. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of our provincial libraries for hosting uh, viewing parties and to the many teachers, again, who um, prepared their students and incorporated Eclipse Learning into their lesson plans. And now many of our science teachers, they're switching their focus uh, this today, especially, uh, to another uh, exciting educational event, our Provincial Science Fair. So today, over 180 of our top science uh, tips, top, top young scientists, are taking part in the Provincial Science Fair. These students between grades 4 and 12 were chosen to represent their schools, and I'm so excited to be able to go this afternoon to view the projects and speak at their closing ceremonies. The Science Fair, Madam Speaker, it's a yearly tradition, and I remember myself being in the Science Fair as a student. It's a great way for students to showcase what they've learned and put those theories into action. So congratulations to all the participa participants, and uh, of course, a huge thank you to all of our science teachers who I know put a lot of time and effort into their local school and the provincial competition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to point out again that most of us, many of us, are wearing our, our yellow daffodils, uh, and it is uh, Daffodil Month in support of uh, raising funds. And this month, April, is actually uh, uh, Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month, and that happens to be a disease for which just two days ago I marked my two-year anniversary of finishing my treatment. So 
special month for me, and, and in fact, that two-year point is a, is a point at which my doctors had told me that 90% of recurrences would occur before then. So it's a date I've been looking forward to for a very long time. But I, I want to just give a shout out to the Cancer Treatment Centre at the QEH Hospital, which is an excellent facility. I want to give a shout out to all of the doctors, the physicians, the oncologists, all of the nurses in the... Um, the chemotherapy room there, who make it like a, a, the premium lounge at the air, at the at the airport. Uh, they treat you so well in there. The radiation technicians who were so accommodating to me when I brought in family and made time lapses in there and and had a lot of fun with them. Um, it was a very difficult experience, obviously, but a great shout out to them to a wonderful facility and. Some of the uh, cutting edge equipment in the Cancer Treatment Center has been funded by the QEH Foundation, which I've supported for many years, but which uh, now has a uh, more of a special meaning to me. Uh, I ran into a friend of mine who was once the chair of the QEH Foundation, and I said, the new CT simulator that they have in there is fantastic. It's used for planning treatment for cancer patients, and it's cutting edge technology. And I said, it's amazing that the QEH Foundation funded that. And he looked at me and he said, no, the community funded that piece of equipment. And that's true, it makes, we all make that happen by donations to our various hospital foundations. And uh, you know, I encourage people to, to continue to do that. And one more thing, after I had completed my treatment, I was so excited about uh, the outcome. Uh, the QH Foundation actually reached out to me and, and asked if I wanted to be a part of a, uh, a video campaign that they do uh, about patient stories. And I was ex very excited, I said yes, and I said, but, I'm just about to announce I'm running in the upcoming provincial election. <laughs> Said, sorry, we can't do it. You're out. <laughs> but uh, I very much support the foundation and the work they do. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, man, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I just want to say how lovely it is um, to hear that the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities as well. That's a beautiful announcement. Thank you for that. Um, like many, many other islanders who don't live up west, I, uh, I made the trek yesterday and battled the traffic and got as far as Maximville in the Evangeline region. And uh, my son and I uh, found a beach, a deserted beach there, and uh, just the two of us watched the eclipse. And it was a, a, indescribable, you know, it was eerily beautiful and peaceful and just something I'll never forget. Uh, and sharing that with my son uh, was just a very, very, very special um, event. I uh, too wanted to congratulate Katie Baker on her, on being inducted into the uh, PEI Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, Katie, I've known for a very long time, and uh, she and her daughter, Dusty, just recently moved back to PEI, and it's lovely to have her here. And Katie was often confused with my daughter, who's also Kate Bevan Baker, and uh, in school, Richard, of course, uh, Katie's dad taught at Bluefield, where they both went, and they were frequently getting called, well, hopefully not to the principal's office, maybe. <laughs> anyway, they were, they were often getting confused, and I just want to give a shout out to my Katie Bevan Baker, uh, who was in St. John's this last weekend for the, the Canadian uh, Folk Music Awards. She was there. There were three uh, PEI representatives, Kate, the East Pointers, and Don Ross. And unfortunately, none of them came back with any awards. But just to be nominated at that level is, is a, a real achievement. So uh, well done, Kate. I'm so proud of you. And uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> members. Um, good afternoon, everyone here in the gallery. It's so great to have young people in here. Um, not sure who you represent or where you're from, but I'll find out afterwards. But um, I hope you enjoy the proceedings. Um, it's always great to have uh, some interest uh, from our young people, and hopefully it will spur uh, a career for you in the future. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member from uh, the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities for his eloquent message about cancer and uh, uh, our Katie worked at the Cancer Treatment Center in Vancouver and uh, the terrific work that they do all across the country. And I want to congratulate you on your, on your health and um, for everyone battling, uh, you know, keep your, keep your chin up and uh, there are lots of really good stories. So uh, have a great day and uh, hopefully we'll have a good proceeding here. Statements by members beginning with uh, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. The joy of music on PEI is one of our most important values, rhythmically re reaving the fabric of the notes of our island. Many of our, of our musical stars started with piano, in music classes at school, and around the kitchen table, and would remember diligently preparing for music festivals across PEI. Today, I'm pleased to rise to recognize Kay Linkletter, and um, uh, she's a musical legend, and the project of love which she helped create, the Queens County Music Festival. The festival is run as a non-profit organization. It began in partnership with the Qantas Club in 2005. Its purpose? To promote and encourage the growth of music. PEI music students and amateur musicians from all backgrounds and all levels participate in this annual event. The organization was established in 1946, and this year is celebrating its 78th year. There are over 600 entries this year, and they are bringing in four adjudicators from out of province. The festival runs from April 22nd to May 4th this year as a not-for-profit, and recognizing that music is such an important part of everyday life, the festival organizers are keen to continue the long legacy. They are now reaching out for donations and able to continue this work. One of my constituents, again, Kay Linkletter, has been working with the Queens County Music Committee for nearly 30 years and is a driving force in coordinating behind this wonderful event. I would like to thank her for her tireless contributions to the music in a wonderful province. Kay, you have changed many lives and your dedication to island musicians is, is amazing. Thank you all for the volunteers, adjudicators, and all the amazing young musicians that someday will be the this, this will stomp out the music of the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Prince Edward Island is in the midst of a housing crisis fueled by this government's chronic mismanagement and lack of foresight. Despite warnings from industry and dooming census reports revealing the dire shortage of skilled workers, the government has failed to prioritize targeted labour immigration, exasperating the crisis griping, gripping Prince Edward Island. The so-called housing strategy, touted by the government in February of 2024, was nothing but a disappointment. Recycled rhetoric and empty promises that insult every single person struggling to find a housing and a place to call home. I hear all too often from young adults and single parents who live in fear of eviction because they have no idea where they would go if they lost their current home. Where are the bold ideas? Where is the urgency? Where is the compassion for those living with the crushing reality of this housing crisis? Instead of taking meaningful action, the government sits idly by, twiddling its thumbs while people are left without access to adequate shelter. They talk a big game, but refuse to support bills aimed at, at, at expediating housing construction. The industry cries out for help, citing a severe shortage of skilled workers as the primary obstacle to build faster. Yet. The government fails to address this labour shortage with new, bold incentives aimed at attracting islanders to careers in the construction industry. Madam Speaker, the numbers speak for themselves, with only 1,139 housing units starting in 2023 against the backdrop of adding another 6,700 new residents, Prince Edward Island faces a shortfall of 5,000 homes. It's, the, for, it, it's time for this government to wake up and realise the severity of the situation. Islanders cannot afford to wait any longer for decisive action, nor should they. The government must prioritize incentives for Islanders to enter the construction industry, align labour immigration with industry needs, and show genuine compassion for those affected by the crisis. It's time to stop with the empty promises and start delivering real solutions for the people of Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Restico Emerald. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And just before I begin, I wanted to recognize Patty Suli, who joined us as well. Uh, thank you for lending us your daughter. Here is the page. Um, so, thank you, Madam Speaker. On April 7th, with an incredible 10 to nothing win over the Halifax McDonald's in the final, a shout out for goaltender George Gallant with 43 saves, the Kensington Monaghan Farms Wild won the major U18 Atlantic Hockey Championship. So a huge congratulations to the Kensington Wild Hockey Team players, Evan Weeks, Derek Andrews, Isaac Tweel, uh, three young uh, men that I know well, Isaac Arsenault, Liam Arsenault, Michael Arsenault, Mason Cook, Hunter Crozier, Jacob Denome, Ethan Dixon, Eddie Doyle, George Gallant, Luke Inman, Aidan McKay, the grandson of the, the Minister of Social Development and Seniors, 
Dylan McLean, Cam McArdle, Matt McDonald, Jordan Shaw, Cam Taylor, Lucas Tebow, and Brian Zhang. And I also want to applaud head coach Nathan DeRoche, assistant coaches Jeremy Ballerson and Nick Reeves. Uh, goaltender coach Chris Gallant, uh, manager Dwayne Richards, trainer Jonathan Gregory, equipment manager Chase Gallant, and therapist Brian Marston. Madam Speaker, this is the first time in 20 years, 20 years, Madam Speaker, that a Prince Edward Island team will represent the Atlantic region at the TELUS Cup, Canada's U18 National Club Championship, and this year it's in Member 2, Nova Scotia, from April 22nd to the 28th, not too far away, perhaps some of us will be there. So a, a huge uh, congratulations again, and a good luck to the Kensington Monaghan uh, Farms Wild at the TELUS Cup. Members, just like to point out, uh, we are a little long-winded in greetings today, and a little long-winded in uh, st statements. So just let's try and uh, rein it in a little bit, see if we can get out of here before Canada Day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It is well documented now that our island is facing a litany of crisis. We have a crisis in our health care system, an affordability crisis, and no one has forgotten the housing crisis that this government seems uh, hamstrung in their attempts to address. So Madam Speaker, we know uh, from this government's own statistics that they are failing entirely in their efforts to use, tar to use targeted immigration to bring in skills trade people, despite every stakeholder, business, advocacy group, and interested party highlight highlighting the reality that we do not have enough skilled trade workers to keep up with the demand. Question to the Minister of Workforce. How many Red Seal trained uh, tradespeople are currently employed across the province? <coughs> Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, we certainly think that our skilled trade workers are essential and important uh, to PEI and, and moving that housing strategy forward, um, and I can certainly bring that number back. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So this government is quick to, to jump to their feet uh, and, and feign empathy for struggles of Islanders dealing with the uh, multitude of crises that have boiled over under their watch. They want everyone to believe that none of these challenges that are facing our province are inside of their government's control. And they certainly don't accept any responsibility for the realities Islanders are living with. Question to the Minister of Workforce. How many students completed their Red Seal training from Holland College trade programs in the last school year? And how many students are slated to complete their training in, these program, in this program this year? Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and again, thank you for the questions. You know, certainly building that healthy and sustainable construction workforce is key and important, and um, post-secondary is certainly the one avenue, and then our apprenticeship programs are, are also contributing a great deal. Um, again, specific numbers, I can certainly check with my department and bring them back. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Well, Madam Speaker, knowing these numbers, and knowing the workforce shortfall our housing and construction industry is facing should be a top priority for this minister. Before we can solve the problem, we must first recognize the severity of the issue in front of us. And yet, with the entirety of her department at her call, these figures elude her. Question to the Minister of Workforce. How many job vacancies are currently being advertised uh, in the housing, <laughs> trades, and the construction industry on PEI? Minister, minister of Workforce, Events, Learning, and Population. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, we keep, we're, the department does keep a close eye. I can grab, grab, grab numbers and bring them back uh, to the member. Um, you know, certainly the industry is doing work on a needs assessment. We're strategizing with you know our construction association of PEI to help with uh, recruitment efforts, and we'll continue to work hard to do so. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, whenever the crisis in healthcare recruitment. Um, is brought up in this house, the Minister of Health will typically crawl to his feet and spout off all the initiatives he has rolled out in an effort to train, attract and employ new nurses. Whereas when it comes to the housing crisis, the Housing Minister and the Minister of Workforce seem woefully unprepared to even try and grapple with the housing shortage. So Madam Speaker, question for the Minister of Workforce. If you're unable to address the labour market gaps hindering um, housing construction, have you contemplated following the Minister of Health's example by concern for the crit uh, crisis in our healthcare system, even if it is only superficially. 
Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, our, certainly our department continues to fund initiatives that are assisting the growing, uh, growing that construction workforce. Uh, programs like Trade Horizons, our apprenticeship programs, our partnerships with the Construction Association, our continued uh, work with our education, our school system, our continued investment into post-secondary. Um, we'll work hard and continue to to ensure that we have trade skilled workers coming out of schools here at BI. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So it's insufficient for this minister and government to merely claim they're doing everything possible while rejecting bills and legislation requested by numerous stakeholders. The housing crisis persists because of the government's reluctance to tackle significant issues. They fail to base decisions on evidence, evident in their inability to provide requested documentation, such as the evidence behind the 25% immigration cut announced by this minister. Question to the Minister, where is the evidence supporting your population framework and will you commit to providing this information to the House or will you acknowledge the lack of transparency in immigration and skilled worker attraction decisions by your department? Mr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we certainly work hard with our stakeholders and our partners, and you know, in conjunction with our Construction Association PEI, we are doing a well-targeted trade mission uh, coming up this month uh, to get those needed workers um, through that avenue. We also continue to work uh, with our high schools. They're working on a tiny home project. We'll continue to work uh, with other stakeholders to ensure that we are uh, working towards meeting those needs. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So the Minister did mention some initiatives, or some, I guess, I shouldn't say initiatives, some things that they're looking into, but the Minister really wanted to demonstrate that she had a handle on the severity of the housing crisis that Islanders are facing. She would stop standing up and giving answers full of empty rhetoric and would apologize for having wasted the entire last year by failing to take any measurable action to train, recruit, or hire any new uh, skilled tradespeople in the housing and the construction sector. Question to the Minister of Workforce. What education incentives are funded by your department and the provincial government to facilitate and to encourage the training of tradespeople in this province? Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are a number of programs we have in place to help support uh, post-secondary learners in our uh, province, anything George Coles, the Island Skills Bursary, our community bursary programs to help ensure that we can remove some of those barriers to get students into the, their path in post-secondary. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So there are great, there are great liberal incentives that were put in by our government last term, Madam Speaker. So, there's also some programs we can talk about, the Apprenticeship Incentive Grants, um, the Apprenticeship Completion Grant. Those are both federal um, uh, programs, Madam Speaker. The federal government has stepped in to do it, but our province is doing absolutely nothing to help the housing crisis. And it's quite clear that this minister and her government are willing to let the federal government do all the heavy lifting when it comes to trained, skilled workers here on Prince Edward Island. Question to the Minister of Workforce. Do you believe that is your job, that it is your job to work towards building a skilled labor force in our construction and home building sectors, are you, or, or are you happy to continue taking credit for other government actions and programs? Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I certainly think um, the benefits are that we work as a whole of government, and I work closely with my colleagues in housing. Um, we work with education. Uh, we work with community stakeholders to ensure that we are getting um, messaging out around the benefits of working within uh, our trades, and we bring a great deal of awareness on those employment opportunities uh, with, with job fairs and such. So, And we'll continue to work with those to, to make, fill that gap. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So it's imperative that we take decision action, or decisive action, uh, to attract and incentivize, train, and employ skilled workers in our construction industry. We understand the urgency of housing crisis and are prepared to propose solutions, even if the government is reluctant to consider them. One effective way to encourage participation in the trades is through accessible and affordable education. Therefore, we urge this government to increase funding and incentives for trades education, similar to their efforts in addressing shortages on other sectors like nursing. Question to the Minister. Will you commit to reassessing and pushing for increased funding and incentives to make trades education more accessible and affordable for all Islanders? Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm certainly happy to explore that. 
<clears throat> member from Charlton West Royalty. Ensuring accessible transportation options for individuals with mobility issues is a fundamental aspect of truly fostering inclusion and equity within our communities. Persons living with mobility issues often have a hard time gaining access to accessible transportation, which is a real barrier for them to participate in community and social events. Question to the Minister of Social Development Seniors. A short time ago, your government launched an accessibility transportation rebate program. Can the Minister provide an update on the participant rates of operators in the rebate program and what steps are being taken to ensure that the program effectively serves the need of individuals requiring accessible transportation? Minister of Social Development Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, we have a we have a wonderful accessibility program here on, on uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, we have 2,500 Islanders who are able to take advantage of that. I do not have the numbers on that. Um, I can bring that back to you, Member. Um, but again, we work closely with the Department of Transportation to ensure that this is this is in place. But I would take those numbers back to you. Thank you, Member from Charlton West Royalty. Others living with d disabilities who have mobility is issues are concerned about why the service does not run 24 hour, 24 seven, and the sustainability of the service. Does this almost $100,000 rebirth program require 24 hour coverage, Minister? Minister of Social Development Seniors. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, we we have partnered with Resourceability, and they do have um, taxis and um, vans. And um, I would assume that those are running 24 hours. I, I met with the owner of those um, that business, and uh, he's running 24 hours in Summerside, and they were moving to Charlottetown. So I know in the the two larger cities that uh, there's accessibility for 24 hours. Thank you. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The service was in the media only six months ago, and was deemed a huge accomplishment by your government. The service was supposed to fill a gap for accessibility needs and making our province more in inclusive. Question to the Minister, is the service even running in this part of the province? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, member, the last update that I got was that it would be moving to Charlottetown, yes. So it, it had been in Summerside for a couple of years, I believe, and now coming to Charlotte. Charlottetown West Royalty. It was in the media four months ago. I'm just asking, is it operational? How many people does it serve? Because we're getting, we're getting information from clients that it's not serving, serving clients that it's, there's major, major gaps in the service, if it's even running at all. So again, Minister, do you know if the service is running or not? Thank you, Madam Social Speaker. Yes, seniors. I believe it's running. Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. When, question for the Minister. In order to be eligible to participate in the rebate program, the service is required to operate for operators for at least five years since it was launched in 2021 that would mean at least go until 2026 question to the minister when services are no longer offered and short of the five-year mark what actions do your government take to make sure that the funds are paid back if the service hasn't been running minister of social development and seniors Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Right now, we are doing an access uh, accessibility uh, residential review, and um, we're going to have more information on that transportation and what that looks like. And that review should be done within eight to 12 months. So I'll have much more information on that then, but uh, it's it's running as we speak. Thank you. Member from Charlton West Royalty. I don't really necessarily, I, I look forward to reading that review in eight to 12 months, but this program only operated for four months, and what we're hearing is it's not running right now. How are you going to ensure that people who need transportation in Prince Edward Island and access, accessibility aspects of things to promote both equity and inclusion get that service if this service is not running anymore in Prince Edward Island here? The yeah, Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, and again, member, we work with Resourceability, and it's them that we fund for the transportation. So I will um, get some more information on that and bring it back to you. Thank you. The member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Madam Speaker, it's disheartening to hear that Ireland is facing the challenges of accessing health care on a daily basis. Question to the Minister of Health. Uh, we learned in the QEH has stopped booking MRIs due to staff shortages, a shortage that won't be addressed until 2025, as the minister mentioned. In the meantime, you'll be con contracting out for services to agencies. Minister, question, when did Health PEI become aware of the understaffing issues? 
The Honorable Minister, or sorry, the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, I'm not really sure on the timeline, but again, that uh, that unit has been op operating at 50 percent uh, for now. Uh, it's too. It's been operating that way for too long, so therefore uh, we are making the unpopular move, I guess, of, of supplementing with staff in order so that our uh, our uh, wait times don't increase any more than they are uh, than they currently are. Uh, um, wait times are important to have them as as, as as short as possible. So again, yes, we will be supplementing only for seven months, uh, but we have two signed offers, MRI techs, that will join our system in January of 2025. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. To the same member, the Minister just said that it's, he's known for a long time. Um, do you think it would have been appropriate to provide them with a stabilization or retention bonus to, and where the MRI tax provided that opportunity to take such a bonus, Minister? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you. Um, again, uh, through the collective agreement process, we have identified some high vacancy positions that we are uh, dealing with uh, in a labor market uh, adjustment part with, with the union. So again, I would recognize that those positions are important. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a, a lot of educational institutions that offer some of these programs that we have high vacancies in. So again, we have to be uh, creative. And I know on the respiratory therapist side, I think we're uh, second or third in the country uh, now that we've uh, fixed uh, improve those wages, so we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. You can't, you can't fix a crisis. When, when the crisis comes, it's too late, and that's what the minister say. It needed to be done before. Madam Speaker, I was asked by an Islander to raise this today. They are concerned this is a very serious example of the failing health system here in Prince Edward Island. This is deeply concerned, as there could be many other Islanders waiting for a call that will never come, or at least not within a reasonable time period. In this case, there were... there. They were advised to contact their family doctor who arranged an MRI out of province. Question to the minister. Do you suggest Islanders waiting for an MRI ask their family doctor if they are lucky enough to have one for an off-island referral? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I would remind the, the Honourable Member that we are we're reacting. We're staffing that unit appropriately so that we can reduce our wait times. We have two signed agreements coming. I don't know what else we can do, but we are doing everything possible uh, to emphasize MRO wait times on PEI. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Question to the Minister. Will Health PEI be proactive now and contact Islanders that are waiting for a call for an MRI to let them know they will, they will not be scheduled for some time. Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, an operational question, but again, when we have those, uh, when we staff up to actually it's 4.8 at FTE uh, that are required to run that unit, when we have that proper staffing in place, I'm sure that they will, uh, they will uh, dig into this wait list and, and, and go at it as aggressively as they possibly can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Willary and Vernes. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Recently, six cases of avian flu have been confirmed in dairy cattle uh, in various states in the United States of America. And this should be a cause for concern for this legislature. Migratory birds from the warmer south that has some cattle producers worried about the disease arriving in the PEI. And avian flu could wreak havoc in our chicken, beef and dairy industries. And no one wants to see that. Question to the Minister of Agriculture. Could the Minister inform this legislature what his department is doing to reduce the likelihood of island cattle herds uh, from a case of avian flu being found here in PEI? What are your protocols? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, we've been in this legislature for, I believe it's six weeks. And this is the first agricultural question. And the, the most important industry on in our island. <laughs> six weeks to get a question and I appreciate the, the members concern for our, our, our most uh, precious uh, industry we have in this island and uh, our chief uh, provincial vet veterinarian is working closely with CFIA to ensure that uh, this doesn't cross the border uh, we've been fortunate here to be able to keep avian flu out of our commercial uh, flocks here on the island madam speaker and we'll continue to work with uh, our, this industry to ensure that uh, all our livestock is safe. Thank you. Well, Minister, I was hoping for a little more details just so you're going to work with the industry in this, but it's very important. Uh, it's one thing to protect our industry from an out the outbreaks occurring here in Prince Edward Island, but do you have a plan in place for if it does happen here in Prince Edward Island? Is there a protocol and plan in place for island producers in case of an avian flu outbreak in any of our herds or our flock? 
And uh, would these herds have to isolate? Uh, do they, is there a particular protocol that has to prevent them from going to sale barns or to the beef plant? Just I want like a little more detail, so it's, if you'd yeah, be so gracious to do. Yeah. Yeah. Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member for the question. We do have the, uh, it's called the PERT, the Poultry Emergency Response Team, that uh, if we do have an outbreak of uh, <laughs> avian flu here in our, in our commercial flocks, it takes over, uh, Madam Speaker, we, uh, we step in and we deal with that uh, incidence. As far as the, uh, the, the bovine side of things, it's new, uh, but of course we have stringent uh, border here between the U.S. and Canada, and CFIA, if, if, uh, but last time I uh, checked, cows don't fly, Madam Speaker, so uh, any cattle crossing the island are inspected through our CFIA. We're working closely, and every cattle at the borders are uh, being monitored, as they always have been. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'm sure I know cattle don't fly, Minister, but you better have a big net to keep those birds from coming across the border here. I'm <laughs> curious how that's going to work. But uh, as I mentioned with avian flu, it can travel. I mentioned migratory birds are coming from the United States. So we're seeing you know, flocks of geese <laughs> in uh, our fields. And uh, I don't think we need to be you know, complacent here. We need to come up with a good plan. But there's also the issue about making sure we're monitoring the situation here. And I want to bring the, the minister response for fish and wildlife into play here. Uh, will you work, uh, minister, with the minister of uh, environment to make sure that we have uh, fish and wildlife officers to pick up any potential dead birds and send them to the pathology lab, make sure that we know that there's a case here or not uh, before it does actually arrive in Prince Edward Island so we can implement some of your wonderful protocols, as vague as they may be. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I will work with our, our Minister responsible for wildlife here in Prince Edward Island. We've been uh, very diligent in our our primary goal the whole time and will continue to be is to keep this uh, disease off our island out of our commercial herds and flocks, Madam Speaker, as uh, we hope that uh, this gets dealt with uh, in a, it eventually will go away. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. After asking uh, last week about the need for sick notes, which I'd like to begin by thanking the Minister of Health for his expressed support in that regard. Um, on removing the burden from our frontline health care workers. I was contacted by uh, employees of this provincial government and was told that this government requires its public service employees to produce sick notes after three to five days, depending on the employee's contract. Question to the Minister of Health, Madam Speaker. Due to the burden these notes are placing on our front line, will you request that the Minister of Finance remove this requirement? Mr. Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I too, I did receive a lot of uh, correspondence, both from from uh, employers on PEI and, and from um, other uh, healthcare professionals about this issue. Uh, there's no doubt. There's two sides uh, to every story. Uh, two sides to this issue about uh, managing absences and again. Um, reducing paperwork for our health care workers. So again, um, some of those requirements are within our collective uh, bargaining agreements uh, on how they're following with, uh, with uh, an absence policy. So again, I appreciate um, the, the line of questioning. I think my, as my role as Minister of Health, anything I can do uh, to help uh, reduce the administration burden on our physicians, I would certainly uh, take that to uh, my workforce colleagues and, and see where we can uh, achieve some balance in that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The other member from Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Minister of uh, Finance is responsible for the Public Service Commission that would make these policies. Five days may seem like a reasonable amount of time to some, but I'm also told that after five days, even if they're not consecutive, the government employee still needs a sick note. A short sickness here and a dentist appointment there, and uh, you can easily get to five days in a year pretty quickly. Question to the Minister of Finance. Will you do your part, Minister, to reduce the burden on our primary care and emergency room doctors and immediately review that policy? Speaker, absolutely, yeah, we'll take an, a review of that and uh, see what we can do in coordination with Mark and all the conversations, oh, Minister McLean and all the conversations he, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
with the Minister of Health. Um, I'll have a conversation with him, knowing he's um, had his head in this space for a while, and um, I'll certainly look into that. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and apologies. The honorable member from Borden Concord, your second supplementary. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Just by way of a specific example of the situation, a constituent of mine reached out to me over the weekend. She's a single mom and often has to use her sick time not only for her sicknesses but also for the, those of her child. Last year she got the flu and took a few days off, then as so often happens, her young child caught the same flu and after the five day mark the payroll department demanded a sick note and she had no option but to take her sick child around for three days to five different walking clinics to find a piece of paper to accommodate the needs of the payroll department. Question again to the Minister of Finance. Uh, specifically, uh, Minister, do you support the removing of the need for sick notes from our Employment Standards Act to ensure that no unnecessary burden is placed on them uh, or on our frontline primary and emergency care professionals? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as a mom, I can appreciate um, that circumstance, and uh, I certainly wouldn't want to see um, anyone have to go through that. Um, um, and I've committed to look into this, um, absolutely. Um, the one thing that I do see is I think the UPSI um, um, agreement, uh, um, UPSI the civil um, agreement, would be something that I think we'd have to look into in order to get into that space. But not saying that that's something that cannot be done. So um, thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. In 2022, tenants of a downtown Charlottetown apartment who had been there for almost a decade received an eviction notice. Prior to the eviction, the tenants had been issued a notice of rent increase of over 10%, which they appealed to IRAC, <laughs> and their challenge was successful. But immediately afterwards, they received the eviction notice. They were told that the owner was going to move into the apartment, which is actually one of the allowable reasons to evict a sitting tenant. A question to the minister responsible for IRAC. The Residential Tenancy Act, which was introduced around this time two years ago, was designed to, amongst other things, protect tenants from unlawful evictions. Are you satisfied that it is performing as expected? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, the new Residential Tenancy Act is, is certainly a large step forward. The old act was old, outdated, and didn't provide all the protect protections that we would expect for both tenants and um, uh, landlords um, in this day and age. Uh, with respect to the specific situation, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, take, for example, uh, the issue of rent evictions. Um, members opposite were calling to extend the moratorium, even though the new act um, has provisions that, uh, uh, for protections around that issue that are much stronger than previously. And in fact, um, I said at the time that I did not believe an extension of the moratorium was required. It's been a year since the new act has been in place and not one request for a renovation has taken place because it is so onerous. So that's just an example of some of the new protections that are in place in the new act. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Sorry. And here we're not talking about a renovation. It's a very different situation. These tenants uh, managed to find new accommodations, the ones that were evicted, and the apartment. And remember, the reason for the eviction was that the owner was going to move into it, was subsequently rented out to another tenant. The landlord lied to IRAC. When I asked the Minister of the Day about this situation, this is over a year ago, before we knew that this was what actually happened, the minister said, and I quote, if a landlord is falsifying and that is not the case, I'm sorry, if a landlord is falsifying and that is not the case and they're using this as a way to evict tenants, that's a serious problem. Indeed it is, Madam Speaker. A question to the same minister. What are the penalties for a landlord falsifying reasons to evict sitting tenants? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it, again, without knowing the exact circumstances of the case that we're discussing here, I can't specifically comment. But again, there are many protections and penalties within the Act itself. Um, for instance, um, you know, we've talked about in here uh, the fact that uh, new lease agreements must include the previous rent and the landlord must sign off on that. In fact, to, to falsify that would be, you know, uh, would be 
de facto committing fraud. So whatever uh, penalties are uh, available under the Act itself, they're all potentially civil penalties through the courts as well. And I just maintain that this Act is much stronger than the previous Act. It has many more tenant protections, and uh, I, I encourage any tenants to appeal to Iraq with any, uh, uh, with any situations that they feel are uh, uh, contrary to the provisions of the Act. From New Haven, Rocky Point, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The apartment was then rented to the folks who moved in when uh, the owner was supposedly going to live there. They discovered, after a little while, that they'd been paying rent that is 66% higher than the previous tenants. The new RTA, of course, as the Minister rightly points out, has very strict limits set at 3% per year to up to a maximum of 6 in certain specific instances. The new tenants on discovering this unlawful increase, again, appealed to IRAC and won a decision that ordered repayment, listen to this, $16,593 to them. I'm sorry to say that this tenant has since also been evicted by the landlord, just like their predecessor. A question to the same minister, yes, the RTA is much stronger, but it still has some fatal flaws and gaps. The only way to control this sort of unlawful activity is to establish a rental registry. Will you do this immediately? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, if I'm understanding correctly here that uh, this was a rental agreement entered into prior to the new Act um, uh, coming into effect, um, if it had been in effect, the, the new tenants would have known the previous rent and known that it was an illegal rent increase. But it does, even uh, in this case, it sounds like the, the tenants were fairly compensated through a, a, a fair process that's in place uh, through an appeal to Iraq. And, uh, uh, again, Madam Speaker, um, I think that the, the new Act is strong. Um, it, it is, like any piece of legislation, a living document that we can adjust. And in fact, there are some things that we are recognizing that uh, we will uh, very likely bring forward uh, for, with amendments uh, to correct uh, in the fall, perhaps. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, last week, students at the University of Prince Edward Island received an email in their inbox that announced the approval of a 5% tuition increase beginning in September 2024. Question to the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. What do you feel is the proper balance between tuition increases and other funding sources when it comes to financing increased post-secondary costs? Minister for Forest and Advanced Learning. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, and we certainly know across the board that uh, costs are increasing, and, and our post secondary institutions are not exempt um, from some of those pressures. So uh, we, we do um, provide funding uh, that is there designed to support you know, the people that are part of the community on the campus, as well as programs and infrastructure, and we will um, strive to continue to do that. A member from Rustic Emerald, your first supplementary. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And the question really was, are you going to give more money so that tuition increase doesn't have to be higher? But didn't get that answer. Uh, Islanders have been told this tuition increase was justified due to the additional hiring of tenure-track faculty members, academic and research budget boosts, and an upgrade to technologies. But this is another stress on students, Madam Speaker. First it was the pandemic and online learning, then it was having education held hostage during a strike, and then the Reuben Tomlinson report came out with its follow, and then now there's a federal cap on international student visas. PEI already has generous supports for post-secondary students, very good, good ones, we heard a little bit about them earlier, but perhaps there needs to be more done. What is the province doing to support post-secondary students in PEI both domestic and international students as tuition fees rise yet again. A question from the Minister. Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you again to the Honourable Member for the question. I certainly think that um, we always need to be investing in our, our students and, and helping support removing those barriers uh, as best we can in studying. Um, we have the George Coles, and um, uh, we look to invest in that, and, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, there's certainly Island Advantage, Community Service Bursary, and our Open Education Textbook uh, project that helps uh, support our students. Uh, and I do know that the post-secondary have bursaries and scholarships that students can apply to uh, and supports on their campuses that are designed to help with international students. Thank you. Member from Rustico Emerald, your second supplementary. Oh, thanks, Madam Speaker. 
So it's clear that more and more of our students um, really uh, are feeling the pressure to work in order to help fund their education and to live while they pursue their studies. Our students want to work, they need to work, and they want to help themselves, Madam Speaker. Um, so last year I asked about the Career Connect program for students and its negative uh, impact on student workforce participation. Um, and I, you committed to last year bringing back the number of post-secondary students who do participate in the Career Connect program. You said you were going to do a regular review and, and hopefully have some results. And you said, I quote, you were going to continue the conversations to ensure that the program is not inhibiting anyone from working or the workforce. So the question for the Minister, Madam Speaker, is do you have any updates on this barrier to increase student employment or are you still just talking? Yeah, the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, thank you for the honorable member and the passion around our post-secondary students. I certainly think that everyone in the room uh, would agree that we need to find supports and provide our, our students with uh, opportunities to learn. Career Connects is just another program as well that students have access to to support um, if needed while they're studying, um, just like any of our other programs around George Cole's Island Schools Bursary and our uh, Community Service Bursary program. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Shelltown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as the complexities in our classrooms keep evolving, it's important that our school system is well positioned to adapt. Question to the Minister of Education. What are we doing to make sure that our school system is meeting the challenging changes of our classrooms? The Honourable Minister of Education, early years. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable mm -hmm. Member, for the question. Um, certainly, our education system and our schools are ever-changing. I'm hearing firsthand about some of the challenges um, that our classrooms, our, our teachers are having. That being said, our this government has made historical investments in frontline uh, staff within our schools over the last number of years. Um, but we do recognize that we need to look um, at this uh, in a more holistic view. And so we had hired a consultant um, to do a thorough review and provide us a, um, some feedback regarding our inclusive education model. So we did receive that report back and I'm um, looking forward to um, providing some more details. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlotte Belvedere for supplementary. So you kind of took the wind out of my sail. That's my next question of, to ask if that report has come back. So I will skip to the next question and ask um, that you have received the report, and that's really great to hear. Um, but um, question to the minister, um, when do you think that we will get to see this report? Minister of Education, Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and my apologies, um, Honourable <coughs> Member. I've honestly been uh, awaiting this report. It's been something that I know is incredibly important to our education system. So it's, uh, it's certainly um, something that I have been pushing the department to deliver on. Um, so we have received the report um, back. What we're doing now is trying to uh, synthesize it into a more actionable plan. Um, so we are, we have it now in somewhat of a draft action plan that's going to be rolled out to our principals uh, this week. Um, really, at this point, we really want to engage our stakeholders, our unions, our staff members, our parents, our students, to ensure that we're on the right track. Um, there's a lot of meaningful changes involved um, uh, with this plan, and so we just want to make sure that we do it right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, during this session, uh, the Minister of Health mentioned that being assigned from the patient registry is not the only way for Islanders to become part of the family physician panel. Specifically, you mentioned fee-for-service physicians. My constituents who have been waiting years to be assigned off the patient registry are now asking me for a list of fee-for-service doctors so they can contact them directly in hopes of being added to the patient panel. Question to the Minister, will you share the list of fee-for-service doctors so that all Islanders can do what they need to do to get access to health care? Yeah, the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, yes, the fee-for-service model is, is one of our pay modalities that we have on Prince Edward Island. I think the uh, Medical Society has been out there and asking um, patients to not flood um, 
a doctor's offices with calls to to be added to uh, to the to their patient registry rosters. Again, they are fee for service, so they do have some control on staffing and costs uh, on how they operate their practice. So again, this is one way to get access um, to uh, to uh, physicians on PEI, and I look forward to uh, uh, sharing a recruitment update in the coming days about some of our uh, physician recruitment success uh, this year. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A member from Charlottetown West Realty. Yeah. Um, so, Minister, just going back, one more question on the MRI. Um, to make matters worse, this constituent that I was talking to, the Islander was out of pocket for the transportation costs they had needed to get off island to get an MRI they could not get in Prince Edward Island. Question to the, the Minister, will the province reimburse this Islander and will the province cover all travel costs for others who may have to go out of province to receive tests and cannot obtain the test here due to your lack of planning? Minister Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And we do have some programs available for out-of-province travel costs, uh, including Hope Air. It's important to note that on any given year, we do send a, a, a lot of Islanders offer uh, for care. It's, a, it's over $50 million that we use our partners in other provinces to provide care that, that we're, we, we don't provide on PEI. So again, um, we look to support them, obviously, locally. For the MRI issue, we've responded. We've, we've gonna, we're going to increase that um, staffing uh, model for the next eight months, and then we have two that will start in January 2025, and we're going to start banging away at that uh, wait list. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The yeah, Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Realty, final question. At the recent spin of the province address, I, I meant uh, state of the province address, the Premier said that uh, there would be, it would get 1,000 people off the patient registry by the end of February. Six weeks later, here we are, and we don't see a reduction whatsoever. Can you please advise this legislature, did we get those 1,000 people off the list? Because it's sitting at 36,970 right now. Did those 1,000 patients come off the patient registry like the Premier said they would? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, we've, all, we've talked about the patient registry uh, list and how manual it is, and it's a kind of an archaic system, actually, in, in my meeting with the CEO of, of Health PEI. She's identified that it needs to be improved, um, that we need to improve the process around the patient registry list and how it's managed. So again, um, it's something that we're focusing on. And as we add the new physicians that are coming on board in 2023, we're going to see uh, some positive uh, movement on that list. Thank you, Madam Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The member from Charlton West Royalty. Well, speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the CBC article regarding accessibility supports for transportation and shows the demand is high, especially in the evenings. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Oh, carry. 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 Reports by committees, introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day government. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall carry. Carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into further consideration of his supply of his, the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall I carry? Sure. Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grants applied to His Majesty. Minister, would, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall I carry? Could you uh, introduce yourself and your title for Hanser, please? Uh, Sherry McCourt, Director of Administration, Corporate HMS and Payroll. Welcome. Uh, honorable members, the uh, Minister of Finance has the floor right now. Would you like to uh, do you have any opening remarks or get right into the estimates? Get right into Thank it. You. All right, members, we are debating the PEI Public Service Commission, and we're starting on page uh, 86. And I'll start reading uh, the sections. Management, appropriations provided for operation of the Office of the Chief Executive Officer to support government-wide leadership and coordination in human resources and general administration of the Commission. Administration, 20,900. Equipment, 1,000. Material supplies and services, 1,100. Professional services, 52,500. Salaries, 284,500. Travel and training, 6,200. Total management, 366,200. So the section, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank yep. you, Minister, for being here. Um, what, first question, are there any special initiatives being funded um, in this budget to support civil servants? Any new special initiatives, maybe, is a better way of putting that? Um, well, I think the, I think that, like, there was a new um, strategy put out or people strategy. Yeah. Um, when was that? That was put last out year, 2023. last year, 2023. So we'd be certainly working our way through um, initiatives that were highlighted within the strategy. Um, mostly focused around um, these four kind of key pieces. You probably have it right there. Yeah. yeah. So the four goals, the goal number one is around retention and employee well-being. Goal number two is um, through development and three, and that would be around their learning and training. Uh, goal number three is we're focusing on talent acquisition and we will be building out our talent acquisition strategy, that's fiscal. And again, modernization, so looking at, you know, driving transformation through the public service through modernization and innovation. And it is in the people strategy from 23 to 2026. Okay, thank you. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know that the PSC conducts, I think they refer to them as pulse um, surveys, which is sort of um, certain departments, they will, they will go in and, and survey the civil servants there. When, when was the last pulse survey completed? The, we normally used to do the employee engagement survey is kind of done every three years and then the, during COVID they did break it into pulse surveys yeah. so every year or 18 months there was a survey and it was focused on different areas like remote work and diversity and inclusion and stuff um, that report will be coming out in the next annual report that should be published in the fall the next full so we're moving away back we always did full we went to pulse which was breaking down to pieces we're going back to full oh, okay and it should be public or it'll be the survey should happen likely the fall of 2025 or the winter of 2026 and then it would be published likely the following fall okay new haven rocky point thank you uh, thank you for that answer and I, I think i missed you you did mention when they'll be made public because i don't think they are currently public Oh, I'm sorry. Some of the results, so like some of the indicators, would be published in the annual report. Okay, thank you. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. And does the department plan any sort of additional? You mentioned that you're going back to the the we're moving survey. away from the pulse back to the general ones. Um, will there be any additional employee surveys being done this year, uh, aside from the general <coughs> ones? Uh, they're just no, not this year, not this fiscal year. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. So, does the PSC evaluate those results um, by demographic groups? Here, I'm thinking about: Do we compare results between men and women, between uh, racialized groups and white groups, BIPOC workers, and things like that? Those, those are the type of indicators that you'll see published in our annual report and in our people strategy. There's some numbers there already. So, if we go back and look at the annual report, 
the last time that we had some of that information, like from 2018, some of the indicators did talk about uh, people who self-identified in the diversity groups and things yeah. like that, and the gender, the gender number is there, and yeah, I think if you went to the latest annual report that was just published on page 24, we have a number of our indicators there, and a lot of the information we would have picked up through our surveys. Okay, that's, that's great. Appreciate that. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And final question for this uh, set. Uh, under professional services, the Ethics and Integrity Commissioner was commissioned uh, $32,000. Um, can you tell us what was done, and is there a, a report from that that you could share with us? Um, I'd have to take that back, but her work is based on the requests, right? So, and then she bills per per request. But I'm I'm sure most of that information is confidential. But I'd have to take that back. Okay. Okay. Uh, Borg Nikora. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Um, how often does the Public Service Commission um, meet with UPSI and other unions? Um, is that, that, that would be my On a regular point. basis. So the, the Director of um, Human Relations and Labor Relations and her team, she's a labor relations team, they meet on a regular basis with all the unions. Or in Kinkor? I wonder if we could put a finer point on that. Is it just ad hoc or inf is it informal? Is there formal arrangements? There would be formal. <laughs> there, and there's informal as well, right? There's constant communication because of just the type of relationship that we would have with the unions. Do we, do we know typically what's discussed uh, in those meetings? I wouldn't have that information. Uh, Gikor, I assume you're getting to I, the budget on this with this line of question? Uh, I, I may not now uh, further to that last question, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm working there. Thank you. Uh, um, so do, do the unions have any involvement in the, the creation or amendment of um, Treasury Board policies that might set the rules for civil servants and also feed up into into this budgeting process? Well, I don't think the unions would necessarily um, create any objectives related to Treasury Board policies or anything. I, I, don't, I don't see a connection as of yet in the role. I haven't seen a connection from the unions to the Treasury Board. Board mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, just a couple of quick questions on this area, Mr. Chair. With respect to exit interviews, does the Public Service Commission conduct exit interviews? There, it is the responsibility of the client department to conduct exit surveys. Board okay. Gincor, um, are they done in healthcare as well? I couldn't speak to that. So, Borg Corps, we're on the uh, management section of yep. the office of the CEO. Yeah, yeah. And so you were asking about exit surveys for health. Well, generally speaking. Just maybe the, uh, if you're leading up to something, just yeah. get to it, maybe. Yeah. I'm sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I mean, we, we know the cost of attrition in the workplace um, and, and, and how that might factor into, you know, the overall spend and the overall loss and, and we've seen we've seen um, deficiencies in spending because we can't get staff so I guess it, it all feeds up into into that general question of do we have the information are we gathering the data you know that's that was this whole line mr. chair of questioning with respect to the consultation with unions and, and the exit interviews just to see if we're if we're getting the information sorry that took a long way for me to get there I, I grant grant that but and I just wonder if the if the minister or, or, or the stranger might have any comments generally with respect to that. Yeah, the, the exit surveys are conducted, and the information is shared, the individual departmental information is shared back to the client departments, but summarized because it's confidential, like the exit surveys are confidential in nature. Um, and then the, the sort of aggregate data is shared back to the client departments if there's themes or issues so that they understand perhaps what's going on. But again, uh, exit surveys are confidential in nature and anonymous can be anonymous. They are anonymous, but you can speak to an HR manager if you wish. But the data that's collected through our tool is anonymous. Board Gigor. Okay. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total management three hundred sixty-six thousand two hundred. Shall carry. 
HR Management and Labor Relations. Appropriations provided for representation of government in collective bargaining and the administration and inter interpretation of the Civil Service Act. Collective agreement and labor related issues. The division also provides human resources and payroll advice and services to departments. Administration, 10,100. Material supplies and services, 3,900. Professional services, 710,000. Salaries, 3,604,200. Travel and training, 33,000. Total HR management and labor relations, 4,361,200. Questions? Uh, Leader of the opposition. Just on the salaries, there is a $500,000 approximate uh, increase. Could you tell me what is the purpose? Was there new positions filled or created? There is for this fiscal year. So there's a new HR team for the new client department, Housing Land Communities. So there's four uh, positions there, an HR manager, an HR officer, HR assistant, and a payroll and benefits coordinator. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. On the professional services, um, so that line is pretty steady across the board. Um, however, when you look at what um, some of the reasons uh, that were put out here for professional services in it, like a contract uh, to McGinnis Cooper for Labor Relations and Human Resource Management Service for Public Service for the education sector, um, is that something that's just normal work within there every year and that's why the budget is usually just it's consistent yeah. yes and it's a it's a we go to RFP every three years okay and we negotiate contracts so the one that you're looking there now is a new one that we've just negotiated last year so the two law or the two law firms that you're seeing for health yeah. civil and education that is uh, they support labor relations and we do work every three years for procurement and they'll be in play for the next three years okay. leader the opposition thank you very much chair so those are completed now what what may well, it's a three-year contract. Okay, so when when is that when is that completed? Uh, it, the new contract was just signed, I think, in February of 2023, just last okay. year, February March of 2023. So it'll be three Ooh. years. Leader, the opposition. Thank you, Chair. So, are there any other new contract negotiations that would be under this particular line? Um, no, but those are the two major contracts. Okay. You'll see, there's a small one there that we had to contract out to somebody last year for to complete hearing tests for okay. 4,900. Right. But that's. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, how many collective agreements are set to expire in this fiscal year? Okay, just one sec. Okay. Expiring this year or like expiring this year? Uh, I sorry, I guess the next fiscal year, the fiscal year we're debating here. Okay. I'll um, ask about currently in a second. Okay. <laughs> uh, the PEITF will expire September of 2024. Okay. And the QP education assistance just expired March 31st, 2024. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So did you say the QP1 had just expired? Yes. Okay. Are there any others that are currently expired? Yes. And if so, uh, could you tell us which ones? Sure. Uh, the QP Health expired yeah. March 31st, 2023. Uh, UPSI Health expired March 31st, 2023. And uh, QP Education Support expired June 30th, 2022. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. Um, and I, I know there are, there are always contracts that, that there are gaps between agreements. I, I get that. Is, this a, is that a typical number? Like, I'm thinking here about the QP Educational Support one. That's yeah, two like years. Is that the go negotiations are underway, so they just haven't. There's, so there's nothing here that is expired that there's not work already underway. It's just that a new agreement hasn't been signed. But yes, they're all actively under negotiation. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah. And, and is that a typical number for uh, this point in any fiscal year? Like yeah. two or three that are ongoing? Usually, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. New Haven Rocky Point. So, what kind of labor issues does? the PSC deal with in a, in a typical year? Like, what are the most common complaints or, or concerns that are raised? Um, I'd have to bring that back to you. New Haven, yeah. Rocky Point? Yeah. Yeah, and having met with the unions a, a few times, I know there are a broad range of concerns, and some, some are specific to a particular union because of its circumstance, but there are 
Um, so there are no sort of general things which you see coming up time and time again with the unions? Um, I wouldn't have that information with oh, you. Okay. <coughs> We're on the, uh, the Labor budget late part of it, I guess. Mm. Like, I'm not sure. If you don't have I'm not that the director part. responsible for no. that area. Okay. No, so I don't New Haven, Rocky Point. Okay. Um, under the professional services here, there's a lot of funds that are spent on legal services for the contract negotiations. I mean, obviously, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering how much of that is done in-house and how much of the professional services would all be presumably outside of the department. Yes. How, how are the law offices that will represent the PSC chosen in a situation like that? That was through a, a, an RFP process. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. All right. And do those, is that RFP just for one fiscal year? Or no, is it's it, for three years. Oh, for three years. Okay. And it was just negotiated last year for three years, so we're in a... This would be our complete, we just finished our first year of the three-year contract. Okay. But that's always been like that. And every three years we do go out to RFP and... Is that the contract you just talked about with mm -hmm. the yeah. opposition? Okay, yeah. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So is there any internal legal capacity within the PSC or is no. it all, no, it's always far, all, all of the negotiations yeah. are farmed We out. have a labor relations team inside the PSC yeah. and they work with these law firms. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm good for the section. Thank Shall you. the section carry? Carry. Occupational health and safety. Appropriation provided to reduce the cost of injury and illness at the workplace through prevention and facilitation of rehabil rehabilitation programs and to stimulate a commitment to safety among employees, which will be reflected in their work activities. Administration, 4,500. Equipment, 3,800. Material supplies and services, 2,300. Professional services, no. Salaries, 273,500. Travel and training, 7,600. Total occupation, health and safety, 291,700. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Just a couple questions in this section. Um, does the PSC track the number of complaints uh, or sexual harassment, not sexual harassment, excuse me, workplace harassment complaints that it receives annually? Yeah. I would say yes. Do you have the numbers? Yeah, there was. I think that. I think I actually brought that back to QP. Yeah, there um, was. I know so it was discussed. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there was. Yeah, there's four, like for fiscal year 22 23, there was 14 harassment complaints right. filed. New Haven, Rocky Point. Do you keep stats on the number of complainants who leave the service? perhaps because it directly as a result of what what happened I don't remember seeing that number in uh, the conversations I had at that time when we were looking into it based on the question in QP um, that was not a statistic that I that was put forward um, we could certainly look into it and see mm -hmm. if that is something that they carry in their New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't know either, but I, I would expect at least some of them, depending on the severity of the situation, mm -hmm. would say, um, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. Anyway, I'd, I'd be interested mm -hmm. to see that, Minister. Um, the unit is also tasked with reducing the cost of injury and illness in the workplace, and I'm wondering what prevention programs are in place to support that. I can't speak to all the programs, but there is programs there within the section, and there's a lot of training that they do with with the civil service, and there's a number of programs that the civil service can take, but I don't have as much information as you're asking okay. with me. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, we've, there's been a fair amount of talk of uh, in the last little while on sick leave and paid sick days and sick notes, and I'm wondering if allowing staff to stay home is part of occupational safety, is that actually explicitly written anywhere that if staff are sick, they're encouraged to stay home? Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. No, we would have that policy. Again, something we can bring back. Yeah. Um, yeah, more prepared, I guess, on the budget. We have lots of numbers here for you. <laughs> New Haven or Occupy? Right. Well, here's, a number. here's one for a number. Um, how many sick days does the average employee take within the PSC? Is that, a, is that a data point that you keep? I don't know if it is a data point, but I, I can tell you, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not, because one thing that I've um, seen since taking this role is the PSC does carry um, and maintain a ton of statistics. Um, impressive really um, 
um, what the statistics that they do keep and maintain. Um, so um, certainly something we can bring back if, if yeah. that's just something you want an answer to. Um, yeah, she's just looking through the annual report. I appreciate report. that. It's there, but There's yeah. a reason why I'm asking There is this. numbers yeah, in the yeah. annual report, but I don't know if there are specific. Go ahead and rock your point. Yeah, well, while you're continuing to look there, and the reason I'm asking this, Chair, and I appreciate the, the latitude you're giving me, is that when we debated and, and passed the sick days legislation, uh, research shows that the, the average number of days that a worker takes is, I think, eight or nine, maybe ten a year. Um, and I know that the provisions of the bill that we passed are only for one day a year. It's different within the Public Service Commission. I, un I understand that. But I was wondering whether the stats within the PSC actually uphold the research that we had done when we brought forward our bill. Yeah, I don't know. Like, the, we do track some of those in the annual plan on page 15. So there's information about the number of employees, the number of total sick days that we have, and how they're broken out by percentage. Okay. Do we have a rocky point? And, and do you have an average number of sick days that a PSC employee takes in an, on an annual basis? It's, it's summarized data, right? So based on like 3,167 employees, they talk about unpaid would be 16%, sick leave paid 8.22%. So it's, it's just an aggregate number. It's a summarized number against the number of employees. But we don't have a breakdown that on average how many days, how many days somebody okay. has. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm good with this section. Thank Shall you. So the section carry? Sure. Staffing costs, or sorry, total HR management and labor relations, four million six hundred fifty-two thousand nine hundred. Shall it carry? Carry. Staffing classification and organization development. Staffing classification and HR planning. Appropriations provided for provision of advice and service and ensuring that qualified, competent employees are selected for the staffing of position vacancies in government and in the health sector. Appropriations are also provided for the administration of the diversity program, human resources planning learning and development. Appropriations are also provided for the administration of the job evaluation system used to classify all government jobs, as well as positions in the health sector and other public service agencies and organizations. Administration, 20,000. Equipment, 48,600. Material supplies and services, 64,000. Professional services, 95,000. Salaries, 4,052,700. Travel and training, 308,900. Total staffing, classification, and HR planning, 4,589,200. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Just a couple of quick questions here. Starting with the administration line, um, mm -hmm. fifteen thousand dollars was budgeted. Went up to fifty-two. Is actual what you spent uh, or was forecasted? Um, what was that for? Uh, and it's just a one-time event. You'll notice that it's gone back down now for this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But last year we had the introduction of the internship program, and just and we were putting the budget numbers in, so maybe we didn't. We put all the money across all the accounts that we thought we required, and then now the year has gone by, and this year for 24-25, we moved some of the money around to different accounts. So it might have been a little bit higher last year in administration, but now this year it's been moved to travel and training. As well, we had to outfit some of our staff that work remotely with cell phones. So we made that purchase for them, and we also outfitted some staff so that they could work remotely. So we moved them from like a workstation to a laptop. Leave the opposition. Thank you very much for that. Uh, one other question on professional services. Yes. Um, 75, 75, and then it's up to 95. Um, why the increase of 20,000? This year, last year we had received some funding to start our classification review. Mm -hmm. And this year we received an additional 20 to continue with the work on our, we're looking at modernizing our classification system, so that additional 20 is towards that. Yeah. Leave the opposition. Sure. So the classification review, is that something that is, a continual um, every year, or what would no. this typically be under? Let's say for last year for seventy-five thousand. Typically, what would be under this? Yeah. So last year was the first time that we had money in that mm -hmm. budget for this, and it was for the classification mm -hmm. review to start to look at it. So we we did secure a firm that is helping us go through the review process, and this year we received an additional twenty because once we get the recommendations back, we have to look at how we're going to implement the recommendations. So we have some additional funding now to help us implement those recommendations. It could be changes to the existing system, or we may be starting down a new path. But we are not finished with that study yet or that report. Okay. Leader of the opposition. But other than that study, what typically would be under this professional services? Uh, they this? normally don't have any money in that area. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Um, Board Kikora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
a, a couple of years ago, the um, Standing Committee on Health and, and Social Development made made a recommendation, and I'll, I'll read it verbatim, that the, um, the committee recommends that government initiate an independent review of the internal hiring process across the Department of Health and Wellness, Health PEI, and the Public Service Commission in order to identify areas of opportunity to strengthen the recruitment process. Was that completed? So yeah, I think you're referring to the Davis Peer report. That is that is that what you're referring to? The, what you tabled there a while ago? Or yeah. Kinkora? Just if you could voice and rather than noddings for answers. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, my understanding is um, the report um, was there was a, a, a draft done. Consultation was done with all the um, um, folks that you just listed, and the draft was done, and um, feedback was given um, back, and I think that's where it sits to this day. Yeah. New or, uh, sorry, uh, Borden Concora. So is, is there recommendations from that that are going to be pursued? Um, there were recommendations in that report, and, and um, I, th I can tell you that um, whether the, I don't think the report still sits in draft form, but it, people weren't waiting um, for it to become finalized to start the good recommendations that were put in there. So I can tell you that work has been done on a lot of the recommendations that were within that report. New, uh, boring Kikor. Sorry, I, I may have missed the last little bit of your of your final statement there, Minister, but I guess I'm wondering if there's going to be a report of the findings or a timeline for the completion of that work? Um, well, I guess, yeah, it's, it's the report itself um, still sits in a draft mode. Um, but um, I guess what I'm saying is that's not to say that the recommendations that were in there weren't acted upon. Um, so there are um, quite a few pieces of work that have already been completed and or in the process of completion based on the recommendations. Poor Cora. Um, and I, I guess sort of further to that earlier line of questioning from, from question period that we had, Minister, mm -hmm. um, I believe you had mentioned that there was a, a new process or a hiring pipeline that was being explored. Is that any closer to reality? I. I can tell you honestly, when I came back from that, um, we, um, like, there, there was kind of like, so that, that flow chart that you tabled was both classification and hiring. Um, and then the supplement there was that Nova Scotia, and that's kind of the piece we talked about, was the Nova Scotia piece that was just classification. Um, so um, we did do work on that. I was trying to figure out um, there's no current um, um, internal full spectrum, um, what do you call it, um, flow chart? Pipeline. Pipeline um, um, that's mapped out. I, I would say that internally most people are looking at the recommendations that were being put forward and implementing um, streamline processes and I think we have a whole list of things that we could identify um, under the PSC of items that we're doing to streamline um, um, so I think that's the focus so when we got into the flowchart um, in order for it to be um, I was trying to find a way to take an example and build it out so that people in this house and islanders in general could um, see that process for, um, you know, I was looking at the example of a nurse. Um, what's that experience? Um, because I don't think um, to build it out as the David Pierce report did would be super helpful right now. And what I can tell you is at the time, nurses, for instance, were an urgent item. So that's you'll see in a lot of our initiatives that we've put forward in PSC to streamline that process was really focused on nursing. Um, and so putting in into place the nursing portal hiring. Um, another another item that, um, like I, Sherry can probably list them them off, um, but there's a whole list of things. And I think that at the 
at the root of it is what we all want to get at is cutting red tape and making sure this is as efficient as possible and, and getting those jobs filled. So I think the meat of what came out of that and what's being intended to in government is there. Um, um, a lot of incentives to streamline and Sherry, I don't know if you have a list. I have a list, but do I want just to read a few? Or? Sure, like if that's of interest to you. Sure, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so it's sort of a, it, the, the teams all work together. So there's a professional team from the Public Service Commission and Recruitment. There's a recruitment team from Health and Wellness, and then the, the talent acquisition team from Health PEI. And the three parties work together to look at all these processes and do the improvement. So over the past seven year to 18 months, a lot of the work that they've done is around trying to look at high priority positions. And again, nursing's would mm -hmm. fall into that category and looking for ways that they can improve the, the onboarding and recruitment processes. So they, they've like reviewed open to the public competition files and they are now, they used to be, if you had something over competition, they didn't look at it till after the competition closed. Now they look at, the staffing consultant looks at it daily and then they reach out to the applicant within 48 hours and start having conversations around, do you want to be interviewed, your references and things like that. They've shortened their interview processes. We do more virtual interviews now than we used to. Uh, we've shortened the reference form. That's part of after you've been interviewed, the next phase is the referencing piece. So the reference form has been shortened. Uh, and I think we've heard this before where they've, um, we have one large, one position questionnaire for large groups of the same occupation. So for a nurse, an RN1 or a 3, there's only one PQ when in perhaps history there was multiple PQs for those positions. Anyway, for anything that has a large group of occupations now, we have one PQ. We are doing conducting in the last year or so for sure the mass interviews for large groups of, you know, the graduating classes or large groups of people like that. And that's like with LPNs, RCWs, uh, nurses and medical secretaries. Uh, we've been creating centralized lists and pools for ready to go candidates. Um, we, the minister talked about the, the nurse portal, so that if you want a nurse and you're experienced nurse and you want to apply for a job, you just have to go one place now and apply and send your references and move forward. In the, in the past, it would be you would look into the jobs PEI and you would see a list of all the different type of nursing positions that were available. Now you just have to apply once and then they contact you to get your preference and, and what, where do you want to work. And it's just one application. Um, then yes, and then some of the things that we're talking about when you're talking about the workflow for the nurses, uh, they've changed the process and when how they hire their graduating nurses or the graduating nurse students. So if they're known to health PEI, they and so that means they've worked in the system in, in the health system, they just need to be referenced and they can move forward and get a letter of offer. If they're not known to PEI, we still have the same process where they have to be interviewed, but we have shortened that process as well. Uh, last year, in July of 2023, we launched the new Jobs PEI website. So in the past, when you applied for a job, you had to fill out the application and do all the steps. Now when you log into Jobs PEI, you can just drop a resume and you're done. And, it, and, we, we'll, and maybe it's, we're still continuing to work and improve that area. Uh, again, yeah, we're looking at... Um, you know, improving the applicant tracking system. So we do have one now, but we're to complement what we've been doing. We're adding other features to it. And, and recently we moved from in-person testing to online testing. <coughs> so now we can do more candidates and test them faster than we used to because we used to have to come to the office. Now we can do that virtually. Thank you. There, there's a lot there. Yes. Um, and I mean, that's been the last year to 18 months that mm -hmm. these three teams that meet on a regular basis have been working on and trying to improve these processes. Um, I guess a couple of questions further from that is, is everything you've described there, that process, the, 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 the innovations, the improvements, the streamlining, um, the efficiencies created, is that anywhere to be found? Is that... You know, if, if I or someone wanted to sort of see how that all interacts and plays out with each other, where does that... Um, like, yes, there, there, there would be, I don't know how you would see it because it's all moving parts or moving pieces and depending on what's kind of, what's happening and which group is responsible for it. But I mean, you could, you, you could go on and see the, if you went onto the nursing's website that they've built now, there is information there and you can see where you access the portal and you apply once and it tells you information where they reach out. Um, I don't know if they posted, like when we talk about that we've moved our testing online, I don't know if there's 
something somewhere that you can go and say, oh, they've moved their testing online. And being when you apply for the position through our website, you'd be contacted, and then your testing would be done virtually as opposed to in person. New Haven Rocky, or sorry, yeah, Port and Concord. Um, and I think if I, if I heard you correctly, Minister, you indicated that we weren't likely going to see this captured in a new sort of flowchart. I guess that's the reason for my yeah. question yeah. to Sherry, is that there, there's so much there, yeah. it almost yeah. really lends itself well to, to some sort of flowchart, at least yeah. based on the positions. It is a fair question. I guess it's, um, um, do you want to see it um, for, it, I guess, the challenge is, do you want to see it for all applicants or like what I was singling out was like a nurse, <laughs> an example that people can understand and, and, you know, then you can tie someone to that process and, and see it better. Um, I guess um, at the end of the day, um, what I could get you that might be just as easy is that list of initiatives that she just listed off. Would that, would that be helpful to you um, it, like because I could certainly take that list that she just rhymed off and uh, and table that if that makes sense it's just yeah we were it it, it is a I thought it was going to be easier than than, <laughs> than what it is but it's such a it's it's such a big net of possibilities and um, you know it's a it's a human process you've got you know, three government departments working together to do this. Um, it's not to say that this can't be done, but um, I think it just, if I tabled something, I don't think it would be um, as beneficial to the House or Islanders as maybe we think it is right now. Um, I think it needs more thought put behind it and some more work. Um, but if that list of streamlining that we've done will help you, I absolutely we can bring that forward. Uh, Boring Kikora, one more. I, I only I only have a very short couple, probably a couple more, Mr. Chair, and then I'm done if that's okay. Yeah, um, that's and good I, with me. I appreciate your indulgence no, on no these. Problem. That it, it all ties to yeah. to the efficiencies and the cost savings that yeah. can be created from having the the the, the program clear. Um, I would appreciate um, your offer to have tabled or provided as a take back as you wish the. Um, the, the summary that was provided by, by Sherry. And, and this would be um, related to the PSC, it, to what we're speaking to today. That would be, that would list, would be um, in relation to what PSC has put in place for streamlining. Yeah. And I also think there's some in the annual report, like we're we, yeah, under our right. highlights. So in that area, under the highlights section, you would see some of those things that I, I listed off. Uh, boring your core. Um, no, that, that's excellent. I would, I would really like to see even, you know, it seems to me that these pipelines or flowcharts mm -hmm. could be, they could lend themselves to be broken down based on, on positions, nurse, mm -hmm. allied health, visit, like what, 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 whatever have you, and then, and then we, we can see that and it's, you know, we can, we can follow from A to, to Z, yeah. hopefully not 26 steps. Um, that might yeah. not be the best alphabetical example to, use. um, uh, I, th I think I made my, my point on that. I guess, um, do, do we know as far as the classification, how long on average it takes to, to get a frontline health position um, classified on average? I think Sherry will be able to pull that up. Yeah, um, um, the, um, but in, in, in regards to that, I think the, I think the biggest efficiency there um, is those um, PQs by position uh, or by an overall position, so um, an RNPQ versus the PQ for every single individual position, like just even making that change was significant. Um, so if you're uh, an RN applying right now, there's zero classification in the process unless it's going to be something nuanced or, or something we don't have a position for right now. But if you're um, an RN applying and it's a ready to roll for the most part there's no classification now involved in that right so i think that um while it might just be a statement on a paper um right now just that doesn't really mean much <coughs> in the day-to-day -day, boots on the ground like just that small change has been significant um 
as far as streamlining that process and not having to go through classification with every position. Yeah. And the yeah. only time we need a classification review is if the client department feels that the job position questionnaire doesn't meet the needs of the position anymore or it's a net new. So yeah. normally, yeah. like most of the job ads you see posted are not, don't have a classification review yeah. component. They go straight into the job ad and are posted. Uh, the numbers that I have here for classification, so in the past fiscal, we are 15% faster, so we went from 41 days to 35 <coughs> in the last fiscal, and 40% faster than we were in year, fiscal year 1920. That's for uh, vacant positions, and for internal positions, incumbent positions, uh, we're 62% faster from, in the past year, we went from 159 days to 61. For high priority positions at Health PEI, they're, they are now being completed less than two weeks, depending on volumes. Board and core. Um, do we, do we, I only have a couple more. Do, do, do we know that the percentage of, of PSC staff that are dedicating their time to um, health care, to certain health PI recruitment management? Yeah, we have 14 that are, that are assigned, uh, dedicated to health PEI for classification and staffing services. Board and core. And something I've raised with, with the Minister of Health, you know, before in the House would be with respect to if we were to move this, um, you know, the autonomy over hiring to health PEI, do we have any idea what sort of budgetary savings would be achieved if we were to place it all under one umbrella with, with health PEI? I wouldn't have an answer to that question today, no. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, how Cheryl? Thank you. On this section, uh, you have the under it. You have the administration of the diversity program. Could you just speak about um, that program? Oh, I, uh, I, yeah. Um, I think maybe just a little bit more specific. Just like when you ask to speak to it, like you're talking about the training that we're doing or the. Show them the report. Yeah. So, is there dedicated staff to that program? Yes. And two. Two. Cheryl, how Cheryl? And then is this for is this for hiring? Or is this for um, w within uh, the uh, the leadership? Is this within the PSC and um, um, the diversity things that you put on? I've I've read the annual report, so yeah. But I mean, is that for, this for? Yeah, like they're part of the they're part of the recruitment process because we have the diversity talent pool and the, the management program around that. But they really are there to support the client departments and, and to helping them move forward with their EDI strategy. Um, in, in July, there was an application date um, for, for a position of anti-racism policy advisor within the Premier's office. Um, the competition just just ended all of a sudden, and uh, my understanding there was a, a qualified candidate, and the competition just ended. Um, I want to know why. Who had the authority to end that? I wouldn't have that detail with me. We'd have I to take that back. Sure, thank you, Charlie. I asked you questions about this on the floor of the legislature, Minister, and I never got a response back. Yeah. Why? Why did the competition end? No, why didn't I get a response back? Oh, I. I, uh, I think there was a response drafted, um, and we probably weren't sure if the Premier was going to deliver it or I was going to deliver it, but I can certainly recall that and bring it back tomorrow. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, I'd like to see that maybe tomorrow if there's a response drafted. Cause it this is, is there. A, yeah. Is there. This is important, and there's... Sure, thank you. Sure. Thank you. This was, um, and I want to know, in a competition like this, just because it's the Premier's office and I don't know the necessary the rules. Mm -hmm. Would the um, deputy clerk of executive council or the intergovernmental affairs deputy have the authority to cancel a competition like that? So, are you saying that the the job posting originally had an end date in mind, and and it's closed prior to what that original end date was posted as? Is that what you're telling me? I know you have a process through the PSC, but when it yeah. goes to the when it goes to the executive council, who has the authority to stop that? What I understand is there was a successful candidate, and I don't know who had the authority to stop that. And I don't know where it became a competition. And I thank you for for this. I don't know who has the authority to stop this competition because th there was nobody hired in this position. So yeah, 
Um, um, we can dig into that yeah. for you. I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that here today. Yeah. Can well. you administer, does that, oh, you're going to follow up on, on well, that, I'll, I'll, that line of question? I'll take that question okay. um, through, like it would, for us at PSE, it yeah. would be more of a process question. Yeah. Um, if you're looking, we can talk about process. If it's more than that, then it would have to go um, to yeah. other areas. And that might be more of a QP question for you. And yeah, that's why I, 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 that's why I asked the QV. Um, but I appreciate the minister, and I'm just trying to figure out where the process. I mean, it, w with executive council, I don't know the process. It's, there's a little bit different rules, so I appreciate the minister bringing back anything and tabling some documents tomorrow. So thank you. Shall the session carry? Carry. Employee assistance program. Appropriations provided for confidential assistance to employees within the civil service, health, and education sectors whose job performance is or has the potential to be adversely affected by work-related or personnel changes. Administration, 5,500. Equipment, 3,800. Material supplies and services, 1,000. Uh, professional services, 1,300. Salaries, 496,300. Travel and training, 7,700. Total employee assistance program, 515,600. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Tell us what sorts of assistance are available to civil servants through the EAP. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, anyone who is um, struggling in any way, um, mm -hmm. it could be a, a number of reasons, um, would certainly um, make their way to the EAP team. Um, there's five folks that work there, um, and um, they're a pretty special group of, of people. Um, when you walk into their office, you, you there's a sense of calm that comes over you when you walk in. They do a great job. Um, but um, yeah, small team, but I would say very effective um, service. Um, nobody waits um, very often to get the help they need. Um, they make it happen, um, but a, a person could go there for a number of reasons. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it's available for employees and their families. Mm. Yeah. And then if if they can't help them, then they move them forward into the system and ensure that they get the appropriate service that is required, and they help them get that. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I, I, it's nice to hear, uh, Minister, uh, that uh, you have such faith in these folks because that's a tricky job, my goodness, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with people in distress. Yeah. Um, are, they, are these the folks, the five that you just talked about, I don't know any of them, but um, w do they have, you know, like counseling degrees, psychology yes, degrees, things like that? Yes. Yeah, we have uh, one intake worker that does the mm -hmm. screening and sets it up, and the other four are clinicians. Okay, all right. New Haven Rocky Point? Yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the last year or two with um, particularly in the health side, I'm thinking just a meeting I had a couple of weeks ago, nurses breaking down, you know, burnt out yeah. in great distress. I'm thinking specifically here about the, the PCU at the PCH. Um, and the, uh, well, burnout is the, is the word that they all, they all use. Um, is this the office that they would come to if they were struggling like that? Yes, yes, they make contact there, and they out, like they do their regular stuff, and they also have um, kind of like emergency visits available to that type of staff. And then they also do lots of articles. Like I know there's a course or a presentation on just exactly that, understanding burnout. So they do a number of articles throughout the year. They, they contribute to the You Matter campaign that we have for all employees, and they write tons of articles, and they're, they're constantly visible to the civil service and to health PEI, and the services are there for those folks. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. I'm so happy to hear that. I have to say, I've never actually asked any of these folks if they've accessed the services of the of the EAP. I'm, I, I will do that next time I meet with them. Minister, you mentioned that folks don't have to wait when they go there, so there's no, you feel that this, this is appropriately um, financed to keep, to provide the services that civil servants need? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's always more money you could put in places, but, um, you know, the report from the team, would they would feel that they are um, serving 
um, folks that walk in the door within a time frame that is appropriate. And they do have access to other resources, so if they hit a critical yeah. point yeah. and they need to bring in extra clinicians, they have that ability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, New Haven Point, one more? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and I, I, I'll make this my last one here. Um, again, I've never actually spoken directly with any of the folks, and I'm thinking back now, it must be at least half a dozen in the last three months or so I've spoken to, um, all, all of who are distressed to varying degrees um, because of the situation at the PCH. Um, the fact that none of them has mentioned this program or this assistance program to me, I, I, are you confident that it's widely enough known in the civil service that this assistance is there for folks who need it? It should be because the EAP office has been in government for a number of years and yeah. I mean same for health PDI, it's accessible, like they support some of the funding for the EAP office comes from Health PEI. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So I understand that, that you know the employment assistance program benefits many benefits the employee along with the employer because I mean they had more satisfied uh, employee that may have dealt with an issue that could be work related or even home related or whatever. Is there uh, any stats on numbers or has there been an increase or is it pretty well the same numbers year after year of employees who reach out to the program for assistance? Yes, uh, in the past, and, and again this is published in the annual report, but now this past fiscal 22-23 at the end of the report, it's gone down 18.5% from the previous year, but we did have a bump during the COVID years. So mm -hmm. when you look at the end of the report, you do see where, you know, a few years ago it would be less than 1,000, then it bumped up to 13, 1,400. So there was a big, one year there was a big increase, and now we're starting to see it's starting to stabilize, like post-COVID. Chair? Leader of the Opposition. So is that 18% decrease in the past year, do, does that bring it down to the norm, or is it 18% less than what was that COVID? 18% uh, in the past fiscal than the year before. The year before. So yeah. COVID brought it up, and then this is we're back down to, to normal down. again. Yeah, we're starting to stabilize. Okay, that's fine. So the section carry? Carry. Language Training Center. Appropriations provided for delivery of French language training services to provincial public service. Administration, 1,500. Equipment, 2,500. Material supplies and services, 3,600. Uh, salaries 221,200, travel and training 300,400, total language training center 529,200. <coughs> Shall I carry? Uh, Leader of the opposition? Thanks. I'm going to ask the same question again about what's trending. If, if these numbers of, uh, if the number of public servants has increased or decreased over the last year or the past few years? Uh, for the French language training? Yes. The salary increase is tied to that there is a new position there. There's an administrative support position to support the new incentive program. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. No, I meant, sorry, the public servants who apply for language training. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, they're up. The numbers are way up. Yes. Way up? Yeah. yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, uh, Chair. Is there any um, feedback or do you have any stats that show that how many would enter the uh, training that actually kind of finish the training or get to a level mm -hmm. where they feel comfortable in, in speaking in French language or working in, in French? I know, like, um, well, they, they um, launched the... Uh, what was the name of it? Um, the French incentive training yeah, the here. French incentive so, um, um, and the intake or the uptake in the program was on rail. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, there's different levels within that. Um, so you would be someone like myself that wouldn't have much French, but go in the beginner. Yeah. Um, um, and they were starting to see people do the beginner, and then it would, would kind of fall off, like you said. But mm -hmm. I think that now they're starting to see more people um, stick with it. And there was incentive built into the program to help people continue on to get to that level of speaking French um, that we would like to see in a lot of different um, places within the civil service. Look at that position. Could you just repeat, what was the name of the, the program that had the new incentive? Do you know what it is? Um, it was launched last, since I came yeah. on, it's been launched, French Language Incentive Program. Incentive program. <laughs> As it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The opposition. I'll, I'll have a look at that. So I do appreciate. I do know 
from speaking with other individuals, regardless of where public servants are located across Prince Edward Island, that the program accommodates them. Mm -hmm. They'll get local um, individuals in to help uh, with the program so they don't have to travel, they don't have to leave work for yeah. such an extended period of time. So I do know that. And, and I do think it's a great program. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, haven't heard anything negative about it. I'm just wondering about how many people would actually sign up for it because they'd be you know, excited about it, yeah. but then go, oh, <laughs> and then yeah. drop out. Yeah. I, like, I do have, like, I don't have the numbers with me, but I have seen that level of detail. Right. But I know, like, in the end of the report, it was like a 40% increase over the previous year. But I know the number of completions now, that yeah. number is high as well. Yeah. I just oh, that's, that's good yeah. news. Hey, thanks, Chair. Uh, the member for Cheryl Town Winslow. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my questions were along the similar lines of the Leader of the Opposition. Um, I, gu I guess my question being is, because I'm a, also a person who takes uh, you know, a French, uh, French lesson on a weekly basis, um, my question is, is, as the province's population diversifies, um, is, and sorry if this question was already, I was trying to follow along best I could, Chair, is there look, or is there a chance that you might look at maybe adding some different lang languages as opposed, uh, believe me, I'm a full supporter of uh, French as a, or it, like fr speaking French here in the province, but I'm w wondering if you're thinking about maybe adding on to that as our population uh, changes a little bit. I, I don't know about that discussion, but I do know like through our training and development fund, so if you want to learn a different language, you can apply to that fund to get the funding to take that training. Okay. So that's, I think, the only avenue that's available right now for taking different languages, so if you want to take Mandarin or something, you can apply and we'll fund it okay. up to a certain level. Shall I uh, this Just a second question. Maybe this was the, the name of the program there where it mentioned, or uh, where there was the drop in the uh, material supplies, or sorry, an increase in the supplies, uh, the material supplies and services. Was that for that new program that you were talking about? The, I forget the name of it already. I don't think so. So you're asking for the, the bump just in that year from 3,600 Correct. to 196? Correct. Uh, yes, that's exactly that because in the training program and the incentive program, uh, we purchased uh, like a subscription license mm -hmm. for Babel and that's the account code that it came out of. Okay. So okay. we had 60 and with the incentive program, mm -hmm. we bought like 15 in the fall, and we've bought an additional 15. So, yeah, that is effective, but that's what the cost was. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Chair. No problem. Uh, Boring Agora. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think I heard this answer, and I apologize um, if it was already answered. But how, how many civil servants are able to provide public services in French? Uh, we have 100. Um, like 100 designated bilingual positions. Now, there's more people in government that are not in designated positions that speak French, but we do have 100 designated bilingual positions. Four in Concord. Um, so those are, those are positions that are designated, so they would only be filled by fully bilingual people. Yes. And do you keep those numbers across each department? Yes, she would. Yes, we would have that. Okay. Four in Concord. Um, and are within, with you know, across the department and the the delivery of government services, are there particular areas where you're looking to, or hoping to improve, um, French language service delivery? I remember when um, on the um, information that came through with that French incentive language training. <laughs> no, I'm saying that right, but um, that within that. Um, they did identify pockets of the civil service that they absolutely wanted to focus on. I, can I recall what those were right now? No. But, um, but I know that there is um, certainly thought behind that. Board and Cora. And my, my last question, Chair, on this section would be, does the Commission have targets for the number of employees that it hopes to train annually? I guess there would be targets in that there's budget allocated to put so many people through the different levels of French training. Um, and um, so I think that, um, I think in every area there's a full 
um, full uptake. So I guess I would tell you that whether you call it a target or not, I think we're using the money budgeted for this um, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry, thank you. Total staffing classification organization development, 5,634,000. Shag Clary. Sure. Administration corporate HRMS and payroll. Administration corporate HRMS and payroll. Appropriations provide for provision of advice and assistance to ensure appropriate personnel administration for the civil service and payroll administration for the civil, health, and education sectors, as well as the management of corporate human resources systems. Administration, 25,300. Equipment, 9,600. Material supplies and services, 9,400. Professional services, 394,200. Salaries, 1,277,600. Uh, travel and training, 444,300. Total administration, corporate HRMS, and payroll, 2,160,400. Uh, leader of the opposition. Um, regarding professional services, so 500000 was the budget estimate, um, but the forecast so far is uh, less than 200000 uh, Could you tell you, just explain that please? Sure. Uh, the 500000 was funding we received last year for mm -hmm. our new applicant tracking system, and we put the five hundred right into professional services. But once we fleshed out the program before we started the, the process of working on the program, we had to, uh, we were able to secure an internal employee. So there was some money moved out of professional <coughs> services contracts then to salaries to cover off the project leader for the ATS system, the applicant tracking system. Then, it would, so that would take it down some. And then the other piece was um, we were delayed in starting the program mm -hmm. or kicking the work off by about five months. So in that five months time, like money lapsed just because we couldn't spend it. So we mm -hmm. didn't really start the program until November. So when we went back and did the third quarter forecast, so the 500 reduced by the one salary person and the, um, the fact that we had lost five months in trying to secure, because we had to secure external resources like a project manager and a business analyst. Leader that position. So would some of that 500,000 be under the budget estimate for the 24-25? For, for this 20, program? For 24-25, we have the 394-200. That will be the professional services. The, I mean, the, the, the person, the salary person is in the salary budget, and that would make up the 500. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I, I thought you meant earlier, earlier the person that was hired mm -hmm. would be that money then went down to salaries. Yes, so that's salary. why it's not 500. So we would have had 500 for the program again this year. Yeah. So some of it is salaries oh. and the rest is professional services. Now I get it, yeah. So, so yes. Leave that position. So I guess that, that answers my question partially for the next line of the change from 877,000 to mm -hmm. 1.27 million. But there, was there other hires also? Will be, yes, in this fiscal, 24, 25. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's two, uh, two learning management system specialists mm -hmm. being secured to support, we are, we're implementing a new learning management system in government and those two resources. So in the salary increase, you would see the ATS project lead that we spoke about and the two LMS folks that we're going to secure. Thank you. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, are there any vacancies uh, in within this section? Uh, I have currently, because it's my section, I have one vacancy that we have a competition underway. Okay. Thanks, Chair. No problem. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, Chair, the underspend in services and overspend or extra spend, expense and salaries has been explained to me perfectly, so I have no questions. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total PEI Public Service Commission, 12813500 Shall it carry? Carry. Thank you. A simpler procedure for this, unless you want to stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good. Are you good? 
Members, uh, we're going to uh, move on to uh, page uh, 58, the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a new stranger to the floor? Uh, yes, please. Shaw Carey? Carey. Welcome. Could you introduce yourself and <coughs> title again for answers? Uh, Kelly Balcher, Director of Finance. Thank you, Kelly. Minister, do you want to just get right into it? Yeah, please. Sounds good. We're going to start with the uh, corporate services. Appropriations provided for the operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister and centralized corporate and administrative services. Administration, 17,900. Equipment, 6,500. Material supplies and services, 8,000. Professional services, 10,000. Salaries, 859,000. Travel and training, 58,400. Total corporate services, 959,800. Any questions? New Haven, Rocky Point. I'm just looking at the salary line here. Hi, Kelly, by the way. Nice to see you again. Uh, we went up considerably last year from uh, estimate to forecast, and now we're back down again. Is, can you explain what went on there? Yes, we do have some additional supports that were required in fiscal 23-24, and there were supports to um, support my finance team and corporate service supports. New Haven Rocky Point. So is that finished now then, Kelly? We are reevaluating. So we do have some of those supports will now fall under the Department of Finance in fiscal 24 <coughs> 25. But we do have needs that are not strictly financial related, that are sort of corporate service related, things like fleet management, accommodations, risk management. So they support myself as finance director, but they're not strictly finance related. So therefore, they fall under the department. <coughs> New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is the right section for this and tell me off if, I, if it's not, but I'm wondering if there's any consideration being given to establishing a, a contingency fund for climate emergencies? There is nothing in this budget for such a thing. New Haven Rocky Point. That's all I have for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry, carry. Forest, Fish and Wildlife Division Management. Appropriation provided for the management and administration of the Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Division. Administration, 25200 Equipment, 3000 Material supplies and services, 19700 uh, Professional services, 53000 Salaries, 315400 Travel and training, 11800 Grants, 15000 Show the section, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. So I see there's a decrease in the professional services here. Can you tell us what that's about, please, Kelly? An increase in professional services. Uh, decrease. Sorry, yeah. decrease. Yeah. yeah. Um, from last year's budget to last year's forecast. Uh, both, actually. Okay. Um, um, sure. So last year we had two hundred fifty thousand dollars allocated to support implementation of the emergency task force recommendations. Right. As well as the forestry commission. Yep. And so we had allocated. Uh, I'm in the wrong spot here. Uh, a portion of that to professional services. And so from a budget to forecast perspective, while we allocated them under professional services, they were spent throughout in other line items. New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, just so I'm clear on that, Kelly. So you mentioned the emergency task force and also the commission. So did that quarter of a million approximately um, that was budgeted last year, was that to cover the entire expense of both of those? It was, project. well, we, we had some existing funds within our existing <coughs> budget to support both, more or less. But yes, it was an, a new investment last year to support both implementation, remaining of the remaining recommendations, as well as the work of the Forestry Commission. Yes. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. So this year, I see we only have 53. So is that the, uh, have the recommendations been implemented? I know they haven't. Um, or is there a reason why that we've dropped down so so much? Yes. So we have retained eighty thousand dollars throughout um, throughout the budget for this section for continued work on the commission and, and recommendations. But within the year, we did accomplish some of those recommendations. So we we didn't implement the fire smart program um, in twenty three twenty four, or it was the initial year. And we, you will see in the next section that we have a permanent budget to continue that. Um, we also did some training with the forest sector on wild, wildland fire suppression. Um, so that was part, one of the recommendations. Yeah. Um, there's a forest sector profile um, being developed with the forest sector um, organizations. 
there was some support to the Woodlot Owners Association as well that um, to help I can actually have a little bit of uh, a little bit more detail on that. to provide the Woodlot Owners Association with hiring a part-time position to support their capacity development and as well as to connect them with programs um, that are offered through the department. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. There's one of the recommendations, I know the task force work, the, the commission is ongoing, the task force is, is done, but there was one of their recommendations, I can't remember which number it was, but it was about um, allowing local wood to be built uh, to be used for structures up to 625 square feet. And I'm wondering, I know we've talked about this in probably question period, maybe somewhere else as well. What, what's the update on that? No, it, the building code falls under housing, land and communities, but the department has um, signaled our support to that department. New Haven, Rocky Point. Right, but given that this is a budget line to support the recommendations from whether it's the, the commission or the task force, um, is, that, is that as much as you do in the department? You signal your support and pass it on to the appropriate other department? Kind of. I mean, all of that money wouldn't necessarily go towards every task if the task belonged to another department. So we would say, we need, we need this done and we're trying to move, we try to move along together. But I mean, this, like the entire climate change file, it's, you know, we work hard to get the other departments to make the motions that we were trying to make so we can do it all right. like together. But yeah, we would be very supportive of that recommendation. As I've said, I support them all. Yeah. So we'll continue to, to push them to make those changes. New Haven Rocky Point. As shall I, Minister. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, I see there's, under market research, there's underused PEI tree species. Can, uh, can you explain what that, uh, which those actually are and give us an update on that? Um, it was red pine um, yep. that was specific. I don't have an up, a further update, but I can consider bringing that back. Uh, just to add, I think that, remember the old plantations that were red pine that were in perfect rows? Yeah. A number of those blew down, but they were they were in perfect condition. So at the time when we were cleaning them up, and I know because one of them is on 48 Road in my area, and I happened by and talked to the foresters that day, it was about looking for a market. Is there, because they're in such pristine shape and they're laying on the ground, yeah. is there something that we can do with them? So I think that's what the money was put towards. I don't know what the results were. But I know the trees are gone. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. So section carry? Oh, Larry and Burnett. Is this the division <coughs> management or the forest fire protect division management? Okay, no, I'll get on to the next question. So the section carry. carry. Forest fire production. Appropriation provided for the cost associated with forest fire prevention and suppression on private and public lands. Administration, 19,400. Equipment, 385,700. Material supplies and services, 54,200. Professional services, 1,500. Salaries, 384,100. Travel and training, 234,200. Grants, 16,000. Total forest fire protection, 1,995,100. I don't even have to look up. O'Leary and Burness. For as long as I've been elected, you get the first question of forest fire protection. There you go. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, anyway, and I do commend the minister. We do have a nice new uh, fire truck uh, for forest fire uh, prevention in uh, the West Point uh, Fire Department, so I do appreciate that. But, but, I, but it raises a bigger question, and it kind of comes from a little bit at the conference I was at in, uh, in Mainz, Germany, regarding the fire prevention, because it's becoming quite an issue. Um, how many of those fire trucks do we have, and do you feel that there are enough of them? I don't have an inventory. Let me see. I'll answer the second part, which looks at that. I never feel like we have enough of anything. <laughs> I always feel like we need we need more. We want to put more money in, but I'll let Kelly answer the front part of it. I don't have an inventory of that, but I can certainly bring that back. Yeah. Uh, O'Leary and Burness. Yeah, and I can't say I know exactly, but I, I'm assuming you have maybe five to seven or something like that, but, and there are various fire departments across the island, and you really only have the one in West Prince, which is based out of West Point. 
but at, at that particular conference, that was this type of an issue was brought up quite a bit on, regarding the impacts of climate change. And one of the one of the discussions we had was around uh, access to water bombers. So if we aren't sure we have enough, and you feel that there may not be quite enough, do we have any arrangement with uh, water bombers to uh, uh, deal with a fire issue if it did get out of control? Yeah, we we do with the okay, but. Uh, it's a good. It's a good question. It's one that I kind of posed to uh, my counterparts in the in the Maritimes at the last meeting where we were all face to face, and I said, you know, m maybe the timing is really good to go to the federal government because there's a lot of money going into climate adaptations that we could upgrade that fleet and we could voice. We could say, hey, we want to do it together. The fleet stays where it is. The, it's where all the experienced pilots and stuff are, and we would know that it would be there for us when we are needed. And it's funny, I talked to a, a, a friend of mine recently about this who is a uh, whole career was in, in forestry and he's, re, he's retired now, but he said he talked about a fire one time that was down in the Murray River area when he was actively working and they had a water bomber on, on site and he said they found a, a fire that was kind of out of their line of sight where they were trying to work and contain it and they were able to come in with a water bomber, put it out, and he said, had that not happened, it might have burned right to Montague from there. Like they, so he said, like, it's a really good resource for us to be able to have to keep fires from spreading. Oh, Larry Inverness. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess that's what, it, you know, the, there's so many options that that comes, and I can see, certainly see where the federal government would be a good potential partner in this, uh, in the respect that if, you know, what we're seeing in climate change issues, it seems to be one extreme to the other. So what might be wet in the east, it may be quite dry in the west, or, or vice versa. And uh, if you at least have some access to a water bomber, uh, services, uh, even on PEI, even if you had to fly one from the west to the east, if there was a, something that kind of broke out or we get into a certain issue where it's exceptionally dry, you could have access and divert it back, right? So it, I just think it has a lot of options for the entire country. And I think the predictions are we're gonna, only going to see much more of that. And in fact, Canada was actually one of the, had the most amount of forestry loss in globally, you know, uh, last year based on those fires. So I, I just, uh, so uh, just to uh, want to get another question that's not related so much with the fire, but does do with the fire protection. And it's the issue of, uh, I've had a number of people that, and I noticed this driving around my district a bit where there's some, I'll say old forestry roads or something that seem to be cut out and they had a mulcher go in and make them a lot wider. And I'm told that they're sort of uh, designed for fire breaks. And uh, I, I want to say that that was, hasn't been done in a long time, so I commend you for that. But I also was getting comments that they ran out of money and couldn't go as far as they want to. So when I look at uh, grants, now maybe that's not where the section, you had 187000 you spent under grants and forest fire protection. I'm assuming that's where that money went or some of that money went. Now it's down to 16000 That's not a very large amount of money. So is that where that 187000 went to do? Uh, we had a special fund for that. No, uh, that fund where that cleared those that land would have been the field services section. Okay. Yeah. So here the grants relate to the normal grants and annual grants are the for the volunteer fire departments. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in this year, um, let me just think here. But if you uh, like, I'll, I'll ask that question. Well, and we'll find more money. Like the whole idea, and as you recall, in the the spring session of last year, it was really really dry, and there was fires kind of happening in in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and all over Canada. And we were pretty worried here. Everybody was pretty worried here. And we had no fire ban. Remember we put a place during the assembly and then it started to rain and we kind of we kind of lucked out. But at the mm -hmm. time, the fire breaks were, were part of the strategy of the department to help in, in case we had another dry spell and it could. So if, if there's a bigger need there, we want to address it 100%. I feel, I feel actually I'm more concerned about this coming year because the, the, yes. the blowdowns and the debris that's in the woodlots today, is, it's going to be much drier. Like it, it, in, in my estimation, in, in my woodlot anyway, I, I would say it's, all, it's now worthless. Now, unless we can find some market from a biomass perspective or things of that nature, it's, it's now too decayed and, and uh, doughty, I guess is the word, where it's not uh, going to be much good for the pulp and the lumber logs and things of that nature. I mean, of the ones that blew down, and we're talking, I think, what was it, 30% of our island forest blew down, so so there's a lot of debris there, so I'm quite concerned about the 
risks of fire, and uh, uh, I would like to sort of make sure that if we have fire breaks that were designed to be fire breaks, that we've at least cut them all wide enough that, and get them all done, not because we're out of money, I guess. So, uh, but I will get into that question when we get to that. And section. I agree with you. Yeah, okay. So we're on the same page. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, and I, I agree too. I'm on great concerns in my district when I drive around, you see the amount of blowdown and how little of it is actually being cleared up and of course it's going to be way drier as you said uh, this summer already is. Um, I'm looking at the uh, the equipment line here um, which was five over 550 last year but less than half of that was spent. I'm, I'm wondering given the minister wants more of everything why, why that equipment line was half unspent. So we had $550,000 um, new investment last year to upgrade fire equipment and training for the fire suppression team. Yeah. Um, so here we have it's fully spent within the budget, um, but it's spent across different line items. So it, there's certain of it in the equipment category, as well as the material supplies and services category. Um, so it's spent on things like fire hoses, nozzles, drones, batteries, um, fire resistant clothing. Yeah. And there's also $175,000 of it to support the Firefighters Association with upgrading their fire equipment. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Right. So some of it is cross-checking now. I, I get that. It's just in, in a different line. All right. Um, when we send firefighters to uh, fight fires in other jurisdictions, and we sometimes do that, is that cost, would that be covered in this section here? Yes, you would see the expense covered within the section. Um, so that's probably why you see, I think there's an increase in salaries um, <coughs> there yes. for increased standby callback over time. Right. Um, we do recover those costs, and those recoveries are recorded as revenue. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. And conversely, if we receive support from other provinces, now we've been lucky so far we haven't had to do that, um, do we end up paying for that? Like, not immediately, but they, as you've just described, basically you send a bill at the end of the, the job and, and we have to pay for that? Is that how it works? That's correct. Okay. Um, point. Thanks. The pro province, we've used satellite imagery in this unbelievably detail. I still can't, it boggles my mind the detail that you can see from these things. Um, and we've sort of identified forest areas with high, medium and low risk for, for fires. And I'm one, or that was ongoing, I think, last time we talked about it. Is that analysis being completed now? Oh, is it done? Sure. I, I'll have to get you an answer to that. I don't know. I don't know for sure that it's completely done. New Haven Rocky Point? parts of it that are done, for sure, that we're acting on. But. Right. Sorry, Minister. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. Uh, one of the challenges here on PEI, we, you know, we have a relatively large percentage of our land is forested and there's no like wilderness. You can't, you can't go terribly far without seeing a house here on PEI. So any forest fire is going to endanger pretty quickly uh, somebody's property. Um, and I'm wondering in those high risk areas that, we, that have been identified, what we're doing proactively and maybe <coughs> what my neighbour was talking about a little a minute ago about those fire breaks that, that you're doing, is that or anything else being done in those high risk areas to protect people's property? Um, that is a, a good question too, I don't have the answer. I know there's a number of things that have been kind of thrown around. I think that in, I believe it's Nova Scotia, they have like a sprinkler system that if there's a fire coming down they could they'll come along and hook it to your house and turn it on and it's basically meant to protect your, your house so there's been talk about should we invest in something like that something that can be moved around at the time of a mm. fire and help protect i don't know if some of the departments may have their their own but we're those conversations are kind of preliminary as far as actual physical equipment that we might be able to deploy at time of fire that could be useful okay do we have Rocky Point? I, th I think my last one in the section, Chair, and it's about the unbudgeted grant that was given to the PEI Firefighters School. Can you tell us what that was for? Yes, yeah, so that was part of the $550,000 oh, okay. um, that was in equipment, and we reallocated two grants. Understand. Okay, thanks, Chair. And the, just uh, I just got to know what the update is due in the next two weeks the, oh, okay. yeah, on the pictures. The Great. Satellite, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. 
Production development appropriation provided for the production of trees and shrubs for forest management on private and public forest lands, watershed enhancement, local landscape nurseries, and the tree improvement seed production program. Administration 45,400. Equipment 12,000. Material supplies and services 493,500. Professional services 15,500. Salaries 1,099,500. Travel and training 18,500. Grants 600. Total production development 1,685,000. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Well, when it comes to production of trees and saplings, that one of the recommendations from the Forestry Commission is not a new one, it goes back from pre previous commissions as well, is to move the, the um, emphasis to hardwoods. And I know that's more costly, they take longer to grow, I, I get all that stuff, but um, when the Forestry Commission presented to Standing Committee, they were clear that we were really falling down on that. We're not moving to hardwoods. Are you doing anything to rectify that, Minister? Yeah, I think we, we are increasing it. Is that... I do have a note on that. Um, the nursery is continually working to increase the number of hardwood trees it grows and is expecting to have 30,000 this year, in increasing to 70 in 2025. Right. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a lot. I'd, um, I, can you tell us what percentage of the saplings that we grow or the seedlings we grow that represents? So no, we're, is it six percent? I will have to bring that back for you. Okay. New Haven, <clears throat> Rocky Point. And I, uh, forgive me, I, d I don't have the goals and the, the targets that the Forestry Commission suggested, but it was. We're, we're way, way, way below. So it strikes me that 30, this 30,000 this year and 70 next year is not going to get us close to that. So is there a long-term plan to fix that? So we talked <coughs> internally about, you know, is there places where we can buy tree varieties that, that match ours off island, like if we New Brunswick, for example, or Nova Scotia, is there private tree nurseries where we can buy a larger volume, or can we work with some of our local tree nurseries? And there's a number of them that are. That are here in BEI, and get them to take some of it, some of it on if we commit to, to buying them. So it's a matter of getting a, a clear path. Path. I think we we've grown the softwood so, like, we have such a good system for our soft for our yeah. softwood growth, and we have to put some effort into bringing this one along <coughs> to be the same. But I think at the in the interim measures should be to find partners that can do some of the work, and probably already are doing the work. Some of these nurseries will be growing to a bigger size before they move them out, but we may be able to be a partner at an earlier stage with them. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. I know federally there was, there's the, the sort of infamous two billion tree program that was that was uh, brought forward just a couple of years ago, and that's also like fallen way way short of where they'd hoped to be. How how does the province tap into that? The presumably there's money through the the two B T two program. How do you tap into that? We've used it. I mean, we've, we've expanded our nursery. We have more um, greenhouses now because of it. I think okay. we're bringing double our size. <coughs> what we're capable of doing there. Um, some of the funds are are meant for municipalities. So you'd be really interested to see like Charlottetown and Summerside do. Uh, Right, you know, um, urban forest type ideas to get more trees growing, in. and I mean, you know, all the reasons why they were important in urban areas. So. Yeah. But but part of the fund is meant just for them. Okay. Sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. I d actually did not realize that part of that fund could be used to expand mm. your physical capacity here on, yeah. on the island. All right. So is that is that where where we spent? Is that where the money came from from the Frank from the Frank for the Frank Goody? Tree nursery to expand it. Okay. It was related, yes. Okay. <coughs> Chair. New Haven Rocky. And I'm, I'm just wondering if those upgrades there have been completed now, or are there other plans to make it bigger? Yes, I think they're completely done in fiscal 23-24. We had a small amount of cost um, to finalize that project. Okay. I'm good for the section. Thank you. O'Leary and Verness. I, I just want to clarify. You mentioned hardwood. There was about 70,000 trees. Did I get that number? So how many acres is that going to plant? Not many. <laughs> 70,000 next year in 2025. I would have to bring back those. Well, oh, they're in Brest. Okay, just to give some simple numbers there, that's a little over 100 acres. So 
you know how many trees that blew down, how much harvest that's going on, uh, that's not even close, it's not even a drop in the bucket. And I guess, I, as you know, Minister, I uh, debated a little bit with you last year about the fact that we had announced that we're planting more trees than what we had that we could do in the nursery. And I have talked to uh, people that were planting trees and they ran out of trees. They could have planted more trees and they did not. It's a perennial issue. I, <laughs> I agree. I, I struggle with it all the time. And we only have the capacity we have. This is why I keep saying, like, expand our horizons and let's go buy trees in other places and, and bring them in here. I mean, at, at the very least, we'd love the trees planted, if that's the case. O'Leary and Bernice. And, I, and look, I appreciate and I know you have a passion for this, but where I'm getting frustrated as a critic, we keep saying we're going to do these things and we don't. Uh, it's, it's great to say we're going to plant all these trees, but then we find out we don't have the trees to plant. <laughs> And, and, and then when we say that we're going to find trees elsewhere, we don't find trees elsewhere. Or if we say, you know, it, it sounded like a pretty big announcement of the amount of 70,000 trees and it wouldn't plant 100 acres. I mean... We planted 1.3 million trees last year. Yeah. But, but, just, it's just the hardwood variety that we don't have to the level that the Forestry Commission thinks we should have, so we're responding to that. And, and, that's where, where yeah, and that's where I'm coming from. If the Forestry Commission is the advisor to, to say where we need to be, I, I would say, and you're agreeing that we need to get there, the ultimate issue in uh, connecting the dots, we've got to get there. Yeah. And, and uh, I just don't see that we're, we're in that pace. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just think we've got a huge issue in our forestry industry here that, that has great potential. But I go, I just I go through my own woods, I go through a lot of the, the woods in, in my district, and it's a mess. It's just there's, I don't know what we're going to do. So I, I'm just wondering, is there any plan from a production perspective to, uh, to try to clean these woods up in a bigger way where, where we can find a market for these things? Because what I'm finding now, when I talk to a forestry contractor, they look at my woodland and they say, it's, it's all, it's blown down, it's all, and it's gone too far. I mean, I was lucky enough to get some harvested and cleaned up, but they, they want trees, good trees to cut. They, they got no market for this stuff, right? So um, I just think we're going to have to really get serious, and you're really going to have to focus on cabinet to make sure that they're giving you the resources to do what you need to do. And I think you're, you know what to do, <laughs> just you got to get there. So... Uh, uh, I'm just saying that, you know, is there, what can we do to ramp up the forest, J, Frank J. Goody Nursery to get the amount of uh, hardwood seedlings that we need to have a mixed plantations so our, you know, we can get this industry back on track? Yeah, so we have to expand it. I mean, it's hard to go from 30,000 to a million, though. It's not because it's seedlings and you have to bring them along. So we have to expand our, our services to make that happen. But I think everybody knows that is the case. And just on, on the 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 wood the wood lots, you know, I, I think that missed in some of the discussion is the trees will come up naturally if they're given an opportunity. And I know my own property, mm -hmm. so I live in the woods. When we lost so many trees during the own, it's amazing how high the little trees have have come up in almost no time. Like we're talking nine feet already, some of them, and it's, it's amazing. And like I I lost a lot of spruce trees, and I have, you know. I have enough maples to run my own business here at some point if they if they get yeah. to maturity. <laughs> I probably won't, but I'll have a lot of maple trees because of that. Well, they're in for this. And, and you're, you're very right that, that uh, the forest will regenerate itself to a certain degree, but here's the problem. The problem is you've got all of this dry and decaying trees within those trees that's a potential fire hazard, right? So, so we can say we're going to have the trees naturally generate themselves, but if we don't clean that stuff up and get rid of that, then, then it's the fire risk that, that happens, and that, that's where I'm really kind of concerned. So it takes, I'll say it takes a hundred years or a generation to uh, reforest a tree to, uh, to get back to where it needed to be. Uh, it's not much good at getting 10, 15 years in and the forest fire comes through and, and we lose it all, right? So, yeah. so I, I think that's what I'm trying to say. There needs to be a, a consistent package here that says, how are we going to clean this stuff up? How are we going to go back in and uh, reforest it and reforest it to the new style of species and the things that are working for the old Acadian forest? And uh, how do we find a market to kind of get this stuff cleaned up where we can get contractors that want to do that? And like I say, I, I look at my own operation or my own situation, like you're literally begging contractors to come in. And I, I begged to the point I got a fair bit done, but once they get into the spots that are saying this, it's all blown down, and I've got acres of it, it like these, these swaths kind of went through my woods, not only my woods, it's the, the government's woodland too, which they have a section <coughs> of land right beside me. 
and, uh, and then we got these areas that they designate as a wetland, and then, but it's not wet, but yet there's trees all blowing down and you can't even go in to clean that up. It's, it's, it's just a, it's all wrong headed. It's got to get back to saying a holistic approach to how we get this all back as an industry. And I think the Forestry Commission has some good, uh, you know, synopsis of the industry to where it needs to go. I just think you need the support of your cabinet colleagues to make this a priority and try to get this dealt with. And I'm here to support you. It's just, uh, and just need, need to get the, the whip cracked on the Minister of Finance there. There, there, there. <laughs> anyway, that, thanks, uh, Chair. Shall the section carry? Here. Field services appropriation provided uh, for the sustainable management of 75,000 acres of public land and financial and technical assistance to private woodlot owners. Administration, 32,700. Equipment 13,600, material supplies and services 578,300, Pro professional services 200, salaries 2,659,900, travel and training 203,800, grants 2,187,500, total field services 5,676,000. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Here. And I'm wondering what the breakdown here is between private land and public land but that's being managed under this section. So public land we had, um, let me just see here. Don't know the measure here. Um, plantation maintenance, 49,879. Road and bridge maintenance, 59,574. Tree planting, 27,446. Safe prep, 31,522. And land management services, 609,785. And then uh, let me just look at the private land. <clears throat> they had 164 management plans, 28 hectares of commercial thinning, uh, 49 hectares of pre-commercial thinning, um, 459,000 seedlings, and 218 manual plane tape plantation maintenance hec um, no, in hectares. Hmm. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, I'm not really sure on that, Kelly. Yeah. I, we <laughs> see here in the description that there's 75,000 acres, and then it says public land and private woodlot. So I'm not, I'm not really sure where the breakdown is there. I'd so public land, uh, or cleanup of public land is in material supplies and services. Uh -huh. So our department staff um, carry that out. And then on the private land, so that's over in grants. So that's grants to private woodlot, woodlot owners um, for maintaining their woodlots. Okay. Yeah. New Haven Rock before? Thanks. Um, do you know how much of the land you like? Do you have a goal for how much of the land you'd like to see under forest management plans? Just see here. I don't have any note on a, on a stated goal, but I can check in with the division staff. <coughs> okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Um, and how much of those, the 75,000 acres, how much of that is um, eligible or covered by the forest enhancement plans that we have? It's all of it? Can you clarify the question? Yeah, sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No so we have in this section, um, this is money to manage 75,000 acres. And I'm wondering how much of that is eligible or how much is covered by the Forestry Enhancement Program? So the Forestry Enhancement Program would be for like the, the grants to what, the private owners. Mm -hmm. So this, I think the 75 would be public land. Um, I think so. Yeah, so that's to manage the public land. Haven Rocky Point. Um, okay, and the, the technic so the technical assistance to private woodlot owners that's part of the forestry enhancement plan too, is it not? That's correct. New Haven right. Rocky Point. Uh, okay, um, so you mentioned that you don't actually have a target for how how many acres we're we're looking to manage under this section. So I'm wondering how you how you determine what the budget is if there's no actual target. 
So the 75,000 acres of public land um, is supported as well as on the on the private side, I guess, is what you're you're yeah. asking about. Yeah. I think that they would probably encourage any, you know, any woodlawn owners to to utilize the forest enhancement program. So we probably um, have. We, yeah, we yeah. have to get you the answer, but it, I would, my guess is the staff knows almost precisely how much they're going to deal with. Okay. Kelly and I just don't. <laughs> Fair enough. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. Is it possible, and we see that the grant has gone up considerably. By the way, the Forest Student has some programs, a great program. It you know, does fantastic work. Is that increase in the grant an expansion of the FEP? Um, there is 50,000 of that is to expand the Forest um, Enhancement Program, and it's really focused on um, post Fiona Woodlock totally Cleanup. <laughs> Um, so there's three hundred thousand dollars last year added for that purpose, and another fifty in the current year. But the majority of that is the two billion trees program. Um, right. For so it provide funding for municipalities and watersheds, landowners, uh, private sector planting, and as well as another other um, to support increased um, tree planting. Chair sure. Rocky Point. Thanks. So I'm, I'm glad to see that that grant has gone up considerably. It was fully spent last year. It, is that, does that mean that the municipalities and the various other uh, people who could access that fund, it was fully, it was fully subscribed last year? Are you expecting that when the, with the increase in grants that it will continue to be fully subscribed? I, I expect so, yes. Yep. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point, one more? Uh, no, I think I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. and Burness. Well, I guess to get the fire breaks when issue out of the way, so that's going to come out. So you've increased your uh, grants budget, uh, you know, by a few hundred thousand dollars. Do you feel that that's going to get all the fire breaks in place that uh, that is required? Because <laughs> I'm guessing it's not. But uh... I guess what I'll say is, if it's not, and people are feeling like they need more, let us know, and we'll okay, we'll find money. O'Leary and Burness? Okay, no, well, I, I do appreciate that because I guess, I guess my argument on a, a half completed fire break is really not much good of anything, right? It's either you do it all or you don't. Yeah. And I do know of uh, some landowners in my riding that uh, they started and first thing, everything is gone and what happened and well, we ran out of money so we can't go any farther. So just as an example, so yeah. I, I will uh, uh, follow up on that. Uh, you, you made a comment about a two million tree program but you told me that you only got enough seedlings for 1.3 million trees. So where's the other 700,000? Are you bringing them in from out of province? Or? It's 2 billion tree. 2 billion? Well, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so we're way off of 2, yeah. two billion. We put 1.3 million, but we, what I said earlier is we expanded our um, ability to start seed, seedlings with the addition. So we used the 2 billion tree program the to model. build a nurse, to expand our nursery so that we can have more seedlings. Oh, they're in for this. Okay, so so we now know we have 1.3 million trees of that bunch. How many acres is that going to plant? Like, give you that answer pretty quickly. Uh, to give it to me. Then. Okay, it's about 2,000 <laughs> 2, acres of trees you're going to plant this coming year. Then is the intention. That's that's what you know you have enough trees for. Yeah. So, so then we would have partners like we partner with the watershed and they do some in the repairing zone that type of stuff with the trees. So I've long said I'd like to have more trees, and I think that's been noted by staff that we'd like to have more trees, we'd never like to run out, yeah. we'd like to be able to plant, we'd like to be able to give them away to the public, like all those things, mm -hmm. we really would, so that you can come in and get trees to replace your Fiona. We just, I mean, these are big pieces of infrastructure to build to make this happen, but yeah. I would encourage, like I know you're on the Natural Resources Committee to maybe get, take the committee out to the nursery and see what they do, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. All right, our members, uh, we're going to report, report progress right now and switch time. That's good, Kelly. Good start. Um, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. carry.
Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honourable Leader, or sorry, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I'll call Motion 100 to the floor. Shall it carry? <coughs> Motion 100. Member. Sorry. The Leader of the opposition, opposition Moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas the housing shortage in Prince Edward Island has exceeded crisis levels in 2019, <coughs> exacerbated by a shortage of skilled workers in the construction industry, and whereas the Construction Association of Prince Edward Island has reported 1,000 to 1,500 vacancies within PEI's construction sector, further highlighting the urgent need for action to address this <coughs> issue. And whereas the Nova Scotia government has announced funding for additional training seats in high demand trades and waived exam fees in the construction trades until October 2026 as part of a $100 million plan to recruit, retain, and train more people in skilled trades. And whereas initiatives such as free tuition and equitable wages will attract individuals to work in the industry and are essential in addressing the labor shortage. Therefore, be it resolved that this House urges the government to consider allocating funding for more training seats in high demand trades in Prince Edward Island, similar to the, no the measures implemented in Nova Scotia. Therefore, be it further resolved that this House calls on the government to consider developing further incentives, including free tuition and equitable wages, to attract individuals to work in the construction industry. And therefore, be it further resolved that this House emphasize the importance of modernizing the apprenticeship and trades qualification system to meet the needs of a growing province and address an ongoing housing crisis. <clears throat> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, can I get the podium, please? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise today to call on government to address a pressing issue that affects the very fabric in our community, and that's the housing shortage crisis in Prince Edward Island. And that shouldn't come to news as anyone living here on Prince Edward Island, or anyone actually looking to move here uh, to Prince Edward Island. Uh, the housing crisis uh, is a serious issue for residents of Prince Edward Island who find themselves either in a rental situation where we heard even today during question period where it can change so suddenly and then they're looking for um, um, new housing options for young individuals who are wanting to start their life and build their own home. Um, there are many, many <coughs> issues uh, within the housing crisis that have to be um, addressed. And as far as I can see right now, that's, nothing's happening in, in that particular situation. Um, we all know the crisis has re reached on presidential, on presidential levels, uh, in particular uh, since, or since 2019. And uh, it's further compounded by a severe shortage of skilled workers in the construction industry. And we all know that, we've all seen it. I, I grew up in a construction uh, family-owned business and I recall a time where we would have a stack of resumes about two inches thick of people wanting to work uh, within the industry, whether they were laborers or even skilled uh, trades. We never had any issues with uh, any uh, subcontractors to come in, whether electrical, plumbing, or what have you, um, because they were, they were, they were I shouldn't say readily available, but a timely um, available, uh, not only to ourselves, but also to residents of the area who needed their, their services. Um, we look at the Construction Association of PEI and they sounded uh, the alarm. They reported a staggering 1,000 to 1,500 vacancies within our province's uh, construction sector. And they, of course, have, uh, keep tabs on, on that. They are concerned about it. Um, they, as I said, called the alarm on it because it's very important uh, to that sector that they have a labor force that's able to um, combat uh, what we presently see in the housing crisis here on Prince Edward Island. Um, unfortunately, we don't see the government having the same concern as the uh, Construction Association does. 
And Madam Speaker, this dire situation underscores the urgent need for immediate action to address this pressing issue that impacts the livelihoods of islanders across the board. And I mentioned some young islanders who want to purchase their first home or islanders who live in an apartment or uh, a duplex or, or what have you that may have a change of uh, needs for housing, maybe the family has grown, maybe the location, uh, they want a location change to move closer to other family members. Uh, I know a lot of uh, grandparents who are moving towards their children's uh, area uh, to help with uh, taking uh, for childcare uh, and, and such, and they just want to be around uh, their family. And uh, they're finding it increasingly difficult to access a housing, whether that be a rental or the build of a new one, because they just cannot get a house uh, or contractor to, to build that home within a, a timely manner. And a timely manner to, does change to individual needs, but the cost of it is also incredible uh, right now. I've never seen housing prices so high. Housing prices so high, uh, and they just seem to to go up overnight in the last few years, where they're more than doubled. Even in the rural areas where where I live on Prince Edward Island, um, I have two boys that I know they cannot, without assistance from myself, um, purchase a new home. I mean, that's even with. with with me giving them land, uh, transferring land to them without any cost. Um, so there's other people that, that do, don't have access to that or their parents don't have the ability to give them that land um, or, or support to build a new home. And I really, really feel bad for them because I know what it's like at our, at our, in our situation. My boys just don't want to take on that, that extremely large uh, mortgage and, and have to commit to it. Um, so it's time, Madam Speaker, that this government wakes up and realizes the, the severity of the situation that we're having here on Prince Edward Island. In neighboring Nova Scotia, the government has taken proactive steps to address uh, similar uh, challenges over there in, in, in housing and construction. They've announced funding for additional training seats in the high demand trades and waived exam fees in the construction trades until October of 2026. And that's all part of a $100 million plan to recruit and retain and train more people in the skills trade. So kudos to uh, Nova Scotia for uh, addressing this issue, for recognizing that they, they too had a housing uh, crisis <coughs> over there. And they put a plan uh, in place to address these concerns and these issues to try to assist the residents of Nova Scotia with the housing concerns that, that they have. And it's time, Madam Speaker, that the government of Prince Edward Island does the same here. Mm -hmm. So we've been in asking, we've been encouraging um, this government to address the concerns that islanders are facing, in particular with the housing crisis, in particular in the construction um, sector. Um, and perhaps they could go have a look at Nova Scotia's plan and maybe implement uh, some that would uh, help with the crisis here in Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. And such initiatives are essential in attracting individuals to work in the industry, and they're crucial in alleviating the labor shortage that we presently see here on Prince Edward Island. Um, anybody, I, I even have people come into my uh, office in Tignish when I'm there on Mondays asking me, do you know of anybody that we could get to come do some plumbing in the house? Do you know anybody we can get to come do some electrical work? Uh, we have these home renovation grants that we're applying for. Maybe they got approved or they got a free heat pump and they need to have a, an electrician come in. They need to have a plumber come in and they cannot get a local contractor uh, to even give them um, estimates on the home renovation um, requests that they had put in, whether it's uh, a new roof, a, a doorstep, like I mentioned, uh, electrical or, or plumbing up, up, updates or upgrades. So we need to do something to address that situation and, of course, the lack of housing that exists uh, presently here on Prince Edward Island. So I would urge this House to consider um, allocating funding for more training seats in high demand trades, very similar to the measures that were implemented uh, by Nova Scotia. Um, and by investing in training and education, we can equip our workforce with the skills needed to address the current housing crisis and ensure a brighter future for all islanders. 
Furthermore, we must explore additional incentives to attract individuals to work in the construction industry. And I mentioned, you know, have maybe this government could have a look at what Nova Scotia has done uh, with their plan uh, that they put forward and have implemented, um, that maybe they could take from that, they could tweak it a little bit to make it a little bit more, uh, um, I guess, not acceptable, but more PEI um, um, made um, to help. Um, individuals in the construction industry, and uh, that again, of course, would just trickle through all of the uh, issues that I mentioned earlier, or concerns that I have of individuals uh, that are living in Prince Edward Island, or even individuals who want to move back to Prince Edward Island. You know, we have a vacancy rate at times it was less than one percent here in Prince Edward Island. So the options of housing were very, very limited, and anything that we can do to increase uh, that percentage it will be. Uh, an added asset um, to not only the economy but to Islanders and those who are looking to move here. Initiatives such as free tuition and equitable uh, wages have proven to be effective in other jurisdictions and are essential in addressing the labour shortage. So yes, there are some initiatives here that we have, but they've been in place for quite some time. Uh, we talk about the Career Connect um, and there's some programming through Skills PEI other than Career Connect um, that will help. There is some uh, federal uh, programs that are out there to help, but there really is nothing new from this province that is in place or even discussed that we know of that is going to help the housing crisis that we presently see here on Prince Edward Island. The construction industry um, is begging this province basically to, to help <coughs> them um, attract, uh, train and retain uh, tradespeople here on Prince Edward Island. Um, so now we, we can't overlook the importance of providing fair compensation and opportunities for advancement in this vital sector um, in our economy, uh, Madam Speaker. So I really do ask that the Minister, that the Premier, that the government as a whole work, uh, work whether it's individually or collectively, whatever, to come up with a plan that is going to address these concerns that Islanders uh, are facing, to address the concerns um, of having a shortage of tradespeople here on Prince Edward Island, um, having any kind of programming or incentives to, to, uh, for individuals to go into those trades is going to be beneficial uh, to all. It's going to help us, again, all those areas in, in construction, whether it be residential, commercial, you name it, it's going to have a positive impact on them. But the province needs to start, and they need to start uh, now, Madam Speaker. They need to put programming in place to help these uh, potential tradespeople to get to training, give them some kind of an incentive uh, to, to look into trades. Many years ago, I know, when I was younger, it was pushed into uh, uh, a post-secondary and it was, you know, get a degree, get a degree. But now you see it kind of switch a little bit to more of the trades, more of a demand in the trades, and people can actually make a really good living um, in the trades, Madam Speaker. So it's a matter of getting out into the schools, getting out and educating the, the younger generation in particular, or maybe others who may want to change uh, and a different job um, option, educate them on what these trades uh, can offer um, <coughs> financially um, as an incentive. So, and finally, Madam Speaker, um, I'm emphasizing or emphasize the importance of modernizing, moder modernizing the apprenticeship and the trades qualification system to meet the needs of the growing province and to address the ongoing <coughs> housing uh, crisis that we have right now. So, again. Look at what other jurisdictions are doing to see how they're going to um, attack this crisis and, and what they're doing to, to put incentives in place to, to train and to um, retain um, these uh, individuals who we need in the trades. And when I talk about retaining, I mean, we can't just educate them here and send them off to another jurisdiction. We need to do all we can to train these individuals and retain them here because they will definitely aid in helping the crisis that we presently find ourselves in. And that's unfortunate. So government must ensure that our training programs are aligned with the industry 
um, demands Madam Speaker, and provide pathways for career, career advancement for all Islanders. And that's basically what I was just talking about. Not necessarily just aimed at uh, the younger generation, but for any individual in the workforce uh, who may want a, a change of occupation too, just to show them what these trades uh, can offer to them and how it's also going to help uh, our island as a whole. Madam Speaker. So I will end uh, my uh, comments on that for now, and I look forward to um, members of this House uh, speaking on this motion, and uh, I will finish up at the end of all comments with my conclusion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty seconding the motion. No. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise to speak to this important motion. Um, this is an important one. I think that you hear us talk about it often is that like